TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. And with me now is your friendly neighborhood theologian, Anthony Rogers. How you doing, Anthony? You hear me? Hey, Anthony, you hear me? Anthony Rogers, do you hear me? Hey, now I do. I don't know what happened. You didn't hear me? Maybe you got some crap internet today, or maybe that was me. Did you no, guys? I didn't. Huh? Hello? I, I hear you now, but uh, the, for some reason you were freezing up. Um, Guys, did you hear me freeze up at all, or is that just Anthony? I think it was just you. We'll find out here in a moment. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Anthony, let me know if you're uh, if you if I freeze up at all because that could be relevant to what else is going on here. In fact, just before we even get started, I like to handle any potential tech problems at the beginning. Let me run a speed test real quick. Let me run a speed test here at the beginning just to make sure that that is on Anthony's end, not on my end. Um, let's see, just Anthony, we hear both of you. Check, check. Yep. Some people are saying one, one, good. one. Hmm? I hear you. Oh, my internet's blazing, man. Well, mine was blazing. I so got the I fastest internet on. in the universe. Wait, some people are saying just Anthony. Yeah, I saw Wait, that. Wait, some people are saying hear you fine, and other people are saying just Anthony. All right, guys. Uh, but before we, before we. Let's just check this one more time, because some of you are saying just Anthony, and some of you are saying, hear you fine. Do you hear me fine right now, before we continue? Because uh, I definitely don't want to, <laughs> I definitely don't want to be talking for the next 10 minutes, and then, and then uh, no one hears me. Check, 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 check. Okay, they're saying they hear me. All right, Anthony. Well, Anthony, have you been following this epic dumpster fire? That's been going on? I have. It's been raging like the fires in California. <laughs> it's been, uh, yeah, it's been pretty. Hey, uh, does, your, does, been, your it's been, does your camera tilt down? Yeah. You should tilt it down. You're like on the bottom of the screen. There we go. I don't want to feel like, oh, I'm, okay. I don't want to feel it, like I'm massively superior to you. It's been raging like a uh, opposed mosque that Muhammad orders to be burned to the ground. It's uh, it has been pretty terrible. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do a couple things. We're gonna do a couple things here. Um, uh, Rory Husky, you said, is that me that said yo to you? Yes, that's me. But I was getting ready for a show, so it's not a good time to uh to call and uh, discuss things. But um, in case anyone is, well, I'm assuming everyone's been following the story with Sheikh Yasser Qadi. And the epic fallout. Why don't you go ahead and give us a rundown, Anthony, since I don't think you and I have been talking. I mean, I don't think I've been talking about that with you. I talked about it with Tony, talked about it with Hatun, talked about it with uh, Jay Smith. But we actually have some some cool stuff that we want to go into on this issue because the fallout continues. Uh, but, Anthony, why don't you go ahead and give everyone a rundown in case they haven't seen what's going on? Yeah, so in the first place, as a quick reminder, Muslims have been claiming for who knows how long now, certainly ever since I've been familiar with Islam, that the Quran has been perfectly preserved. And that means both its form and its contents. Its form, meaning the number of surahs, the number of verses, and the order of them, all came exactly uh, down to the present as they were at the time of Muhammad and by the command of Muhammad. And the same thing, of course, goes for their contents. Every single word, every single letter of the Quran came down uh, from Allah through Jibreel to Muhammad and was conveyed to his companions who both memorized it and wrote it down. And through that process, uh, you know, they delivered exactly what Allah had on his eternal tablets. And th those have been perfectly transmitted throughout the ages up until the present. That's always been... Uh, part of Islam's claim to fame, at least that's always been an apologetic point that Muslims have wanted to make, and that's 
actually been behind a lot of people considering Islam to be in some sense superior to uh, other claims, right? The Muslims will often contrast this with the textual history of the Bible uh, or the textual history of, of other religions. Christians have always observed that uh, in the process of copying the text, there have been scribal uh, mistakes, and we believe we can ferret those out through the application of sound scientific principles of, of how these sorts of things enter in. And we have tens of thousands of manuscripts, right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, if you're including the whole span of history, uh, certainly we have thousands uh, of significant weight. In, in any case, the uh, uh, but Muslims have always claimed that the, the Quran is unique, just like it's uh, uniquely from Allah, it has uniquely been preserved. Uh, however, uh, you know, we've been arguing for a long time that that just isn't the case. There, there are issues in the transmission of the Quran, and part of that is, is simply because the Islamic sources tell us that, mm -hmm. right? We know from yep. the Islamic sources, we know from Sahih Bukhari and other places, that there are issues. In, uh, there, there are verses that aren't there. There are verses, uh, there, there are whole chapters uh, that went missing. There, there's just a lot of issues uh, with the claim that the Quran has been perfectly preserved. But Muslims have always tried by hook or by crook to try and get around this. They've, mm -hmm. they've always made one excuse or another, and they, they've appeared to be able to keep a good poker face for quite a while. But, yeah. but the hey, evidence well, well, hey, against Anthony, that... Hey, Anthony, one, sec one second before you go on, because there's a comment that's along these lines, and I just wanted to pull something up uh, as a little teaser here. But uh, Pedro Jr. said, uh, Act 17 Apologetics, what is going to be the next narrative that Muslims will come up with? Let me guess, the Quran has incoherent babble that no one can understand, and therefore it is from God. Um, yeah, I, I actually, uh, Pedro, if, you, if you've if you been following the, uh, the chat and the comments on these videos that we've been posting about these textual differences in the Quran manuscripts, Muslims, as Tony pointed out, Muslims have been claiming that that they're, they're, there's nothing like this, right? That the Quran's been perfectly preserved. And the claim, and I have multiple Muslim apologetics books that claim never a single difference anywhere in any Quran manuscript. And now that the pictures of the manuscripts are being put up in, in videos in front of Muslims, showing the differences, showing that they're different words with different translations and so on. Um, at first, when... <laughs> At first, when we were showing that Yasser Qadi and Shabir Ali were admitting that there are differences in the Qurans, that the Muslims in the chat, and some of you are here, tell, tell me if you remember this, that Muslims in the chat, you're talking just a couple weeks ago, were saying, no, 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 this is just differences of pronunciation of the same word. Because different groups, different Arabic speakers can pronounce words differently, and they're actually comparing this, saying, you know, it's like someone who speaks what you're saying, but with an Irish accent. It sounds different, but it's the, sa it's the same words. That's what they were saying. You guys remember that? We'd, that was just not too long ago. Well, now it's been, now you've got people like Dan Brubaker, and I've been using some clips of his stuff in my videos. Now we're actually putting it on the screen, different Arabic words or missing Arabic words, different translations. And so now the Muslim claim in the chat and in <laughs> in the chat and in the comments is, but it's been perfectly preserved in memory, not in the manuscripts. So even though the manuscripts are filled with differences and yeah, you could go to different parts of the world and they use different Qurans with different words in it, even though that's the case, and even though you can go to the manuscript tradition of the, the Quran and find all these differences, the Quran's been perfectly preserved in memory, <laughs> which is the worst is the worst way to preserve an entire book, right? So it's absolutely hilarious. But I wanted to point this out because, and, and I'm just saying this this is the teaser for a video that I'll be putting out later tonight. Might be midnight. I haven't recorded it yet, but the video I'm making later tonight, so it might be out at midnight or, or one or something like that, is uh, is is an answer to this question, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead and tell me in the chat. And then, so we'll cover this, and then we can get back to uh, Anthony and uh, what yeah, and uh, what Yasser Qadi saying. And by the way, for you fans of Mufti Abu Layth, we're going to be looking at uh, some video clips by him. That dude's hilarious, and so we're gonna we're gonna check that out. But he's actually been criticizing Muhammad Hijab and uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi and so on. And so uh, it's actually it's actually pretty cool, and he makes some important points that we want to get to. But uh, those of you in the chat, tell me. Because Muslims always say, oh, there are, all these, there are all these Muslims around the world who have the Quran memorized. Guys, give me your best guess. How many Muslims in the world have memorized the entire Quran? 
Give me an idea. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. Give me your give me your guess in the chat. You've heard this over and over again that that there are all these Muslims who've memorized the Quran. Give me your best guess on how many Muslims in the world have memorized the entire Quran. So you might, you know, think be thinking 1%, 10%. Obviously, it's going to be on the lower end, but what number do you think? Go ahead and guess. Okay, so what? Well, that's interesting. We have, uh, <laughs> you see the numbers coming in? <laughs> someone, someone said, um, <laughs> Muhammad Nasser said, Muhammad Nasser said, 40 million. <laughs> 40 million have it memorized, right? <laughs> Is that an answer to me? Was that supposedly supposed, was that supposed to be how many Muslims have actually memorized Quran? Now, here's what's interesting. Chloe, maybe he's giving the number of, of variants in the yeah. different recitations, 40 so, million. So Chloe, Chloe says zero, but we had uh, Muhammad Nasser saying 40 million. Uh, we had Samuel Yoder saying 0.5. Phyllis says zero. This is interesting. Uh, Niles guy says less than 5%. Um, Alex Lindsay says 50 Rachel Bhatti says uh, zero. Steven Reniger, it's interesting that people are saying zero. Uh, Ra Wara says zero. Uh, Hindu historian says less than 1%. Um, <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have someone saying 95%. <laughs> uh, Steve McLean, zero. Uh, Rory Husky, Rory Husky says very few. Cheryl R, zero. Hey, John Wilson's getting very specific. It's like the price is right when someone just, you know, $420. Yeah. They try to get right on the money. John Wilson says 420 TS says one. Um, some people are joking, like Steve here, who says 20 billion, but it it's actually fits right into the sort of common uh, sense of exaggeration that we that we find whenever we're dealing with uh, Islamic topics. Uh, LH says zero. Carolyn R says uh, 100. Uh, we have a bunch of zeros. We have some fours. We have uh, people giving percentages, like Renee here says, uh, half of a percent and so on. Um, we have Live, uh, Live Evil 3-4, three, three, who says 0.05%. Uh, All right. And Alicia Goodluck says uh, under 1,000, one, under 1, but Muslims claim 1 million. Walter, 5,000. We don't need to continue. We're basically getting a wide range of answers. And so the video I'm making later is actually on this and it's based on a passage in abu ubaid's kitab fadal al-quran so this is a, an early muslim work where he starts uh he, he gives he has a chapter in his book abu ubaid muslim scholar he has a chapter in his book on uh things that came up missing from the quran and in his book he records a comment from muhammad's companion ibn umar and so this is this is the passage. This is from Abu Ubaid's Kitab uh, Fadal al Quran. And here's a little passage. Ismail bin Ibrahim related to us from Ayyub, from Nafi, from Ibn Umar. Ibn Umar was a companion of Muhammad, and he's the son of the rightly guided Caliph Umar. Ibn Umar, who said, Let none of you say, I have learned the whole of the Quran. For how does he know what the whole of it is when much of it has disappeared? Let him rather say, I have learned what is extant thereof. So what's left over, what has survived. So again, this is Ibn Umar, companion of Muhammad, saying, guys, never say that you've memorized the entire Quran because much of it, notice what he says there, when much of it has disappeared. And then we have examples from Abu Ubaid uh, quoting various uh, Muslims and even, even here, right, right below that, Ibn Abi Maryam, related to us from uh, Ibn Luhai, from Abu Aswad, from Urwa, bin Az-Zubair, from Aisha. So this is from Aisha, who said, Surat al-Azab, Surat, that's Surah 33 of the Quran, used to be recited in the time of the Prophet with 200 verses. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was unable to procure more of it than there is in it today. So they used to recite it with 200 verses, and yet... All we have left over is what remains in it today. Surah, uh, uh, Surah 33 today contains 73 verses. So notice what Ibn Umar says. Let no one say you've memorized the entire Quran. You don't even know what the entire Quran is because so much of the Quran has been lost. So I'll ask you guys one more time. 
You guys are given numbers of the people who've memorized what remains of the Quran, in which case those are people who've memorized part of the Quran. And I'm not sure what the numbers there are. There are some people saying 1,000. There are some people estimating 5,000. Some people saying 100. I have no idea. I have no idea what the statistics are. But according to Muhammad's companions, Ibn Umar, how many people today can say that they have actually memorized the Quran? That would be a big fat zero. No one can say. So uh, the point of the video later is that whenever you hear this, oh, but there are so many Muslims who've memorized the entire Quran. No, according to Muhammad's companions, no one has memorized the entire Quran. All you guys have done, best case scenario, is memorized parts of the Quran. And what's interesting is the reason no Muslim today can say that he has memorized the Quran is because memorization is a horrible is a horrible method of preserving an entire book. You can preserve traditions and sayings and things like that. Memory is very good for that. But when you say, here's an entire book, you run into some problems. You run into some problems because people are going to focus on what they're most interested in. Some parts are going to be uh, recited more than others. Um, and people are just going to forget massive things. And that's exactly what happened in the history of the Quran. So now everyone is saying zero. And that is exactly right. Zero. So anyway, these are some of the kinds of things that you find uh, when you start digging into the Muslim sources and notice it just flies in the face of what Muslims are saying today. Per you know, perfect memorization. That's <laughs> perfect memorization. That's how we preserve the Quran. The process of trying to, to pass on the Quran by memorization is what caused so much of it to be lost. And that's actually the reason that the Quran started to be passed around as a book. Abu Bakr, the, sec the first of the rightly guided caliphs, realized if we keep relying on memorization, we're just going to keep losing more and more and more. So we need a copy of the, a physical copy of the Quran. And so what was Abu Bakr saying? Abu Bakr was saying one physical copy of the Quran would be better at preserving the Quran than our ent all the memories in the Muslim community combined. He said, we are unreliable. We need a physical copy. Why is that amazing? Because today, when we're showing Muslims that they have different physical copies, they say, no, but we have perfect memorization of the Quran. It's so incredibly stupid. And this is, what, this is why the entire narrative is coming crashing down right now. All right, back to you, Anthony. But I wanted to jump on that while you said it and then the comment that yeah. was relevant to it. And then I had that awesome slide already because it's going into a video later. All right, go ahead. Yeah, actually, that reminds me of something else that's somewhat similar to this. Uh, Muslims love to also claim that Islam is the fastest growing religion. They claim that it's easily outstripping others in terms of converts and so forth. Uh, now, if you were to ask people, uh, you know, how fast is Islam growing? Uh, how many people are becoming Muslims every day, every week, every month and year? And how does that compare to other religions? Uh, people would give various figures, usually quite high in, in the case of Muslims. Uh, however, if you look at the Islamic sources, we really should be thinking of this quite differently, just like you gave the example of, uh, you know, the Islamic sources saying that nobody can really say they know the whole Quran. Because if you look at Muhammad's teachings, according to Muhammad, everyone is born a Muslim, right? He says mm -hmm. everyone is born upon fitrah, which means the right disposition towards Allah. They all come into the world believing in Tawheed and so forth. But it's his, uh, their parents, Muhammad said, who make them Jews, Christians. Uh, Zoroastrians and so forth. And so if everyone is born a Muslim and there's over 7 billion people in the world, but uh, the vast majority of the world's population are not presently Muslims, right? The, the, the current stats are far lower than that. What is it? 1.5, I think people are giving uh, today. Um, uh, well, if that's the case, then it means that, uh, you know, uh, five and a half billion people left Islam at some point uh, yep. in terms of uh, people who are presently alive. So the, the figures are far lower. Uh, and and, and uh, anyways, and, and uh, along those lines, it's a, yeah, it's kind of a it's slightly different topic, but it's another example kind of of what we're talking about. I mentioned earlier this uh, this exaggeration, right? Like if uh, if there are some people in the world who've memorized what's left of the Quran, uh, it'll be exaggerated, right? There are tens of millions of people. I've met like two people in my, I've met, I mean, I interact with Muslims all the time. I've been to tons of debates, tons of Muslims. I've met like two Muslims in my life who said that they had memorized the entire Quran. Um, now it's possible that I was around other Muslims who had memorized it and they just hadn't told me, but this isn't as, as common as Muslims would like to. They want to, there are all these, you know, tens of millions of people who've, who've memorized it and stuff like that. There always has to be this exaggeration, but even on the, uh, even on the issue of the, uh, the rapid spread of Islam, 
it's they'll take something like that. Ah, it's spreading rapidly. It's spreading rapidly due to due to high birth rates. So notice one, it's high birth rates in in Muslim countries. Muslims have the highest birth rates, and then uh, <laughs> they don't they w- they don't want to live in those countries, so they 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 leave those countries and go other ways. So that's how that's the main reason Islam is spreading. High birth rates in Muslim countries because there aren't a lot, there aren't usually a lot of opportunities for Muslim women in those countries, and so they just they get married young, they start having babies. By the time a, uh, a young woman in the West is finishing college and then not even ha- hasn't even started a family yet, um, the uh, Muslim woman who was married off when she was 13 or 14 has has 10 kids already, and so that's why Islam is spreading. And then you know. They raise these families, but they, they want to get out of these these countries. I mean, people don't want to live in Syria right now. They want to get they want to get out of Syria, and so so they you know move to the West as soon as they can. And Islam spreads like that. When it comes to conversions, that's what they want to say, right? Oh, Islam is growing rapidly. Therefore, tons of people are converting to it. Actually, in, in places like America, the number of people converting is actually offset by the number of people who are leaving Islam. So it's actually kind of flatline. Uh, when it grows, it's because of it's because of things like immigration, and so. Um, if you if Muslims really wanted to state that argument correctly, they would have to say Islam must be the truth because women have little to do in Islam. And so they are just t- turned into baby machines. And then Islam does such a horrible job making countries that people want to live in that everyone just wants to get out of the countries. And therefore, Islam spreading all over the world. It must be the truth. And that would be a pretty, pretty, that would be a really, really weird, strange uh, argument. And so, yeah, just wanted to point out that this happens every single time, right? Whether we're talking about the preservation of the Quran or anything else in Islam or the spread of Islam, whatever we're talking about, Muslims will 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 cling to something and then just start exaggerating everything beyond anything anyone could ever imagine and then twist everything and somehow turn it into an argument for Islam. When if you actually dig down, if you actually dig down and look at what's really going on, it's absolutely ridiculous that they would that this would be used as an argument for Islam. And so that's the idea with this preservation of the Quran. You've got Muslim scholars, they lie, they make things up. Okay, so some people memorize parts of the Quran and so on, things like that. But no, it's all millions of people have memorized it, and the memory is perfect, and there's no difference anywhere, and this is a miracle. Everyone needs to submit to Islam because of this miracle. You dig down, it turns out to be total nonsense, and that's why people are in panic mode. All right, back to you, Anthony. All right. So I was summing up the case that has been on offer by Muslims for uh, a long time. Uh, you know, I, I can go back and read books from before the time I became interested in Islam. But uh, certainly since I became interested in the mid 90s, uh, the claim that I was hearing over and over again is that everything has been preserved. The exact order of books and verses or surahs and verses, uh, as well as the precise contents, the the words, the letters, everything is exactly. And I, and I could, in fact, just easily flip through any of the study Qurans I have on, on every hand and, and quote to you statements from these. I don't think anybody even needs me to do that, really, because they've probably heard it from their Muslim friends as well. Mm-hmm. This is a well-known claim. In fact, uh, you know, we may refer at some point to Shabir Ali. In fact, uh, we will, because you're asking me to sort of catch us up to where we are. Uh, well, what happened recently was uh, uh, Shabir made a video where he did an about face compared to just, uh, you know, statements you can find from Shabir, uh, you know, only a, a couple of years ago. You know, I, I can think of videos from Shabir. I can think of debates, his debate with Tony Costa, for example, where he claims that the Quran had been preserved down to the letter. Uh, but now Shabir is admitting that, no, there are variants in the Quran. And he's done that in quite a number of videos. I'm not sure if people are familiar with. Uh, even those who have seen the statements from Shabir are familiar with just how many videos he's done recently. Uh, I just watched three the other day that he's done recently where he's actually uh, stating this on his own. In another context, he's actually responding to someone's question and correcting them, saying, no, the Quran has not been perfectly preserved. Of course, in Shabir's case, he does try to downplay this. He, mm-hmm. he uh, often speaks very ambiguously and imprecisely. And I, I think you know, on the one hand, he's he's trying to, uh, you know, deal honestly with with what's there, but also toe the line and, and not look too radical to uh, to Muslims. And, and part of that, by the way, is just the the same old thing where, where people, uh, you know, they're, they're inoculated to things by by people sort of giving it to them in bits and pieces. Right. Where, where they become to tolerate a little bit of this. And then uh, later they, they finally swallowed the whole pill and don't realize it. Uh, 
but what we're trying to do is throw this all out there at once, right, and show people this is the case, especially for those who are being sold the argument that the Quran is uh, the word of Allah because of the claim that it, uh, it's guarded by him and uh, stands out from all other books in, in this fashion. And by, by, uh, by, so the way, Shabir, by the way, Tony, do, do, you, do you remember all the uh, Shabir's mentor? Uh, Jamal Badawi. I want to go. I want to go through and find find his lectures on the preservation of the books. But his lectures would always be the same. Uh, he would say uh, that that Allah revealed the Torah and the Jews corrupted that, and um, the then Allah revealed the, the gospel and Christians corrupted that, and finally Allah was revealing the Quran and He said, "No more, no more." Yeah, this is this is what uh, this is what Jamal Badawi said. He said, "No more, no more." I will preserve it myself. And that's why, so supposedly that's why there, there are no variants anywhere in the entire history because Allah miraculously did it. Turns out to be total nonsense. You could only say that because he was speaking in an atmosphere of ignorance and now the lies are being exposed. What awesome times. Go back. Go, go. Yeah, we, we know what's interesting is, is the claim in the Quran actually is saddled to something else. In Surah 15.9, it says that of a certainty we have sent down the Quran and therefore, you know, it says, assuredly, he will uh, uh, guard it, referring mm -hmm. to Allah. And, and the idea is that it's connecting it to the fact that it's been sent down from Allah. Precisely because this is Allah's book, he's sending it down, therefore he's going to guard it. And so that you would stand to reason that he should be uh, have been doing that with all these other books if, if they came from him. And, you know, I mean, Muslims do have to try and worm their way around that, don't they? Because otherwise what you've got is Allah supposedly raised up, according to some sources, 124,000 prophets over the ages. And to many of them, he gave books. The Quran mentions several of them, a book to Abraham, a book to David, a book to Moses, a book to Jesus. But Allah's track record in the case of all those books that had been given, and no, no telling the number of them, his track record was an abysmal failure. He fell on every single prior occasion to preserve his word. And so, yeah, you've got to make some kind of distinctive claim here, like Allah now suddenly becomes interested in preserving the book. I think it's exceedingly foolish, no matter how you, you cut that, because uh, one of the things that Muhammad wants to claim when he comes along is that he was predicted in the prior scriptures. So uh, in, in order that people might recognize him and so that he might upbraid them for not recognizing him, right? Over and over again in the Quran, Muhammad charges people with being dishonest and twisting things with their tongues and so forth because he's written in their scriptures and they should recognize him. Well, if Allah supposedly gave out these revelations uh, anticipating Muhammad and then let his word get corrupted in the process so that it wasn't in the possession of people at the time of Muhammad so that they couldn't possibly recognize him, well, then Allah's whole approach was, in a, you know, just uh, terribly foolish, right? Mm -hmm. He had no intention of preserving those books. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. No, no, no matter which way Muslims go on this, they always end up making Allah and Muhammad looking extremely foolish. Uh, but in this case, they, they show Allah to be extremely impotent because they're claiming that he would guard the Quran. This was the claim of Muslims. Uh, but now Muslims, because of the, the evidence is piling up, and by the way, the evidence that's piling up includes more than just differences of pronunciation, right? The, the, uh, what sometimes people don't realize, uh, what Muslims are saying here, uh, and Muslims aren't always very clear either, uh, when the Quranic text was originally written, it, it was just a, a consonantal text, mm -hmm. right? That's what Muslims call the, the razm, right? And it was the same thing with the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Uh, only the consonants were written. And one way to, to kind of visualize this is to think of a license plate, right? Um, uh, you know, oftentimes when you look at a license plate, it says something, but usually it's because they've removed certain letters. Well, usually people who know the language well can insert those missing letters. We can figure out what that means, especially if you've got a whole sentence or a larger paragraph, then it becomes somewhat easier. And this would be, would be all the more easy if you are used to doing this sort of thing all the time, right? You're, you're constantly supplying the missing uh, vowel sounds. Well, that's the way a lot of ancient languages work. That's the way Hebrew worked. That's the way Arabic worked in its written form. And so originally the Quran was written just in terms of its consonants. However, the, part of the problem is that there are ambiguities. There are occasions when certain letters could form different words, just depending on, you know, insertion of different vowels. And so uh, if you're only relying on, you know, oral recitation and so forth, uh, differences are bound to result. 
right? Not just differences of pronunciation, but differences of words, because the vowels could actually uh, form different words from, from those consonants. And so, uh, you know, sometimes Muslims pretend it's just differences of pronunciation, but no, the oral recitations differed also in terms of what word they thought was uh, to be pronounced in certain places. But what uh, has become even more apparent in recent years because we're collecting manuscripts, getting access to manuscripts, is that it's not just the pronunciation, it's not just the uh, vocalization of these words, it's the actual consonants that often differ between these manuscripts. There are consonantal differences. And by the way, there uh, I think it was Jay Smith who recently pointed out that there's uh, something like 93,000 different uh, differences in terms of pronunciation, the kira'at, uh, a number into the almost 100,000 differences, and those are just the ones that have been compared at this point. And, that, and that's, so just, that's, that's, that's not just that's not just uh, pronunciation, that's, uh, uh, like, if you go through the uh, uh, the Muslim text, they, 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 that, 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 uh, that co- compilation of, that bridges, it's a Muslim organization that put out their compilation of the 10 different uh, kira'at, uh, it's cool. They have footnotes going through. Hey, these kirats say this, whereas this kira says says something else, and so on. And so it's a uh, uh, lots of stuff going on there. If you believe perfect preservation right down to the letter, not looking not looking right. like that. No matter where right. you look, if you look to the Muslim sources, that's yeah. not what you get. If you look to the manuscripts, not what you not what you get. If you look to the to the to the kirat, it's not what you get. You don't find this perfect preservation anywhere, and yet it's been foisted upon all of them. Yeah, you know, it'd be interesting to do. Another thing I I haven't mentioned uh, is the whole notion of aruf, and I don't even know that I pronounced that uh, accurately, but uh, there's this whole other idea of something called an aruf, which some people say uh, refers to dialectical changes uh, or or differences, uh, you know, within a spoken language, there are different dialects, and so some people would try and account for the kura'at, the the different uh, pronunciations or, or vocalizations, excuse me, uh, in terms of these dialectical differences, but the scholars actually point out uh, that the aruf don't refer to the same thing as the kira'at, mm-hmm. and in fact, there are 40 different scholarly interpretations of what the aruf actually refer to. But but I bring that up because uh, uh, when you look at the Islamic sources, one of the things it points out is you know sometimes uh, uh, the differences that were apparent to people at, at even back in the time when when Bukhari and Muslim and others are collecting the hadith. The difference is at those times, some people tried to account for by saying that Muhammad actually received revelation in seven different ways, right? And, and mm-hmm. what would be interesting to me is if you, you uh, if you look at the claims when Muhammad's getting revelations, is trying to trying to squeeze this in there because, uh, for example, uh, we're told that uh, Jibril would recite the Quran to Muhammad, uh, and Muhammad would recite the Quran to Jibril once a year, right during Ramadan. And then we're told the last year of his life that they did this twice, right? So imagine every time Muhammad's getting a revelation, he has to be receiving it in seven different ways, mm-hmm. right? So he, and then he's reciting it seven different ways to Jibril, and Jibril's reciting it seven different ways to him. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the problem is the kira'at are more than seven. At one point, uh, they standardized seven, then it was 10, then it was 14, because they had all these different uh, recitations. Uh, so it's not even seven. Uh, but in any case, my, my point is just here is just to observe. It'd be interesting to look at these different occasions when Muhammad is supposedly getting a revelation and just trying to imagine how does this even work? Or, you know, Gabriel is Gabriel literally, for example, uh, when when Muhammad is trying to come up with an answer to the Christians of Nadran. Right. We're told that uh, he didn't have an answer for the, the Christians of Nadran at first. But then Allah sent down the first 80 verses of Surah three. Right. Well, did Gabriel recite it to him seven different ways uh, on that occasion before he came out with uh, and did he recite it to the Christians of Adran seven different ways? When did he recite it in seven different ways to to people so that they then learned it in all these different ways? I mean, it just sounds to me like, uh, you know, just hopelessly problematic. Um, and, and, but, and, and, but, but my but, point. Oh, go, uh, yeah. Let, let me just jump in real quick. Uh, by the way, uh, that's where. Shabir Ali seems to be going with a, a more of a combination approach. He's looking at a variety of different factors because uh, this is, and this is what Yasser Qadi was talking about when he said, you know, as Muslims, we hear something and we'll push a little bit and then we'll just, we'll, 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 we'll accept the answer that we're given and we'll just, we'll just keep regurgitating that. 
but this is a perfect example, right? You read, you know, you read about there being uh, these different ahruf and so on, and a sort of uh, novice Muslim who doesn't know much, and he starts hearing what he's, he's heard perfect preservation right down to the letter from the time it's been revealed to Muhammad, but then he starts hearing usually from us about these ahruf and things like that, and that there are different there are differences and so on. And so he goes to his imam, what, imam, what is this? I, I'm hearing that there, that, that there are these different versions of the Quran. And the response he gets is, oh, these are just, these are just, these are just differences of dialect because, you know, there are different areas of Arabia and they spoke different dialects. And so the, the Quran had to be revealed for them as well. And then the Muslim, oh, great. Okay, no problem anymore. Now I know what this is talking about. When, as Yasser Qadi points out, a Western scholar is going to push against that and raise some, some issues. And some of the things that he would raise would be things like, really, are you saying that Muhammad, you know, would deliver this passage in seven different ways? In like, he, like they, these all come from God and he, Muhammad gets them and he says, okay, here's the version for your dialect. Here we go. And he goes through it and then he gets the, okay, what's the next version? Okay, let me, let me reveal it this way. So you have issues uh, like that. Then you have issues like, no, there were, there were people who spoke the exact same dialect who were reciting the Quran in different ways. So it doesn't even fit. These are the kinds of things that Western academics are going to, are going to push back on and say, your, your explanation, uh, your explanation simply doesn't fit. But that's, what's cool about Shabir. He's, he's adding another dimension. So he, he's, He's talking about dialects and things like that, but then he'll add he'll add a couple more steps, a, a couple more uh, sources for these differences. One, he he says that you know in the early Muslim community they wouldn't have been terribly interested in getting the exact wording. They're more interested in like the ruling rather than the precise wording. And so, if you're given a verse, like a verse saying that you know if your wife gets out of line, you can beat her into submission. You don't need to memorize it word for word, syllable for syllable in order to get the takeaway message. I can go beat my wife, right? So you might memorize it differently than the, the exact precise way it was revealed. You just understand, hey, my wife gets out of line. I need to warn her, then banish her to a separate bed and beat her without memorizing the actual wording. And so Shabir's view is they can actually try and get the gist and then they go up and they, and they can quote it however they want. They can recite it however they want as long as they got the basic meaning of the teaching down. But then later it becomes important to get the precise wording. And so that's why someone like Uthman has to start going and, and, and burning, you know, burning all these manuscripts and stuff because some of those manuscripts are based on people's sort of own wording for to get the teaching down rather than the precise wording in which it was revealed. And then Shabir adds um, that... Uh, the 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 early written forms of the Quran, even even with even uh, you know even with the vowels included and so on, if you don't put the if if you don't have the the dot system in there, you can read these things in different ways, and so that could have caused some problems as well when people are adding dots. If they're adding them in the in the wrong places, then you get different words, and so you put all of that together, and you get Shabir's defense of uh, of why there are difference of why there are differences in the Quran. Uh, manuscripts and so on. And uh, it's, you know, you want to look at that and say, uh, I'm not buying some of that Shabir, but I have to say Shabir is light years ahead of what a lot of other Muslim apologists are trying to do and still, you know, say that there are no differences and things like that. And so uh, I think Shabir is heading down a more reasonable uh, avenue right now. We'll see how his case uh, holds up. Right. Well, notice a couple of things about that. It actually confirms your point about the problematic nature of relying on oral uh, transmission, because if you're talking about having the continental text and then later people are adding the vowel pointings, that's what accounts for the differences. That's where they arise from. Mm -hmm. Well, notice where they're supplying those uh, vocalizations from, from memory, right? They're, they're, <laughs> so, so these differences yeah. are, first of all, in these people's memories on how this is supposed to be pronounced. And so that's that's a problem. It, it undercuts one part of. In fact, I heard the other day it was another ambiguous thing, uh, another example of ambiguity on the part of Shabir. Uh, but on his show, Let the Quran Speak, he was asked uh, about uh, how we can rely upon the uh, preservation of the Quran being the case when, in, in many cases, certain verses uh, didn't have sufficient attestation behind them. In other words, in other words, you're supposed to have two witnesses to something and a written uh, form of it as well uh, before it could be included during the uh, the recensions and so forth. 
Uh, and and in, in particular, I think the person was thinking of something like Surah 9, 128, which had difficulty getting into the Quran because they couldn't find sufficient witnesses. Uh, well, uh, you know, Shabir kind of uh, he's very ambiguous here. Um, uh, but he says that uh, it, basically that the uh, uh, this made it in, e- even though uh, it, it wasn't mutawatir because, you know, you could rely on memory, right? Somebody's memory was, was sufficient. One person's memory, this person was so good or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, yeah, I think there's a bunch of problems even with Shabir's. Uh, well, and, and you suggested that already, of course, uh, but but he's trying, right? He, he, but he's and he's admitting things as he's doing so. Uh, that's uh, you know uh, uh, part part of the issue that that uh, leads to the next point, which is that uh, Yasser Qadi comes along, and Yasser Qadi is light years ahead of a lot of these guys, right? I mean, we give Shabir a lot of props. Shabir is certainly one of the better apologists representing Islam. Uh, Shabir is certainly no slacker. Um, but, you know, just, uh, you know, speaking forthrightly, uh, Yasser Qadi is uh, represents the upper echelon, I would say, of Islamic scholarship, certainly in the West. Right. In fact, he's been educated in both contexts. He's been educated both in an Islamic context and in a uh, Western context. And so he's he's familiar with this coming at it from both angles. And he used to even hold the, the, the basic narrative that Muslims were touting, right? Uh, he used to claim as a Salafi. In fact, a lot of Muslims were critical of, of Yasser Qadi prior to this because Yasser Qadi had moved away from Salafism. And I, I suspect uh, the move away from Salafism uh, goes hand in hand with recognizing some of these other issues as well that he hasn't spoken about until recently. Um, and so for those who don't know, uh, recently he was doing an interview with Muhammad Hijab who expected him, I'm sure, to give the the stock in trade or canned answer when, when uh, he asked him basically, uh, you know, if, if the Quran we have today is the same as it was at the time of Muhammad. And the way he put it was, uh, if I gave you an uh, empty uh, Musaf, a, a, a uh, blank document, if you will, and you were to uh, write the Quran on it, would it, you know, from memory, uh, would it be the same? Would it be the same as the one everybody else has? Would it be the same as what the prophet had, what his companions had? And uh, at that point, uh, Yasser Qadi became very uncomfortable, mm-hmm. very uncomfortable, and he started pushing back against, uh, you know, giving an answer or talking about this publicly. Now, here, I, I, I think it's significant. One thing that should be underscored is, again, just how uh, well-educated and rhetorically, I think, gifted uh, Yasser Qadi is, right? The, the significance of that is that, that Yas, I've heard Yasser Qadi, I've listened to him for years. I've listened to hours and hours of lectures. Uh, I mean, you can recall. Yeah, you, know, you, you like, from, you, you like his, you like his, uh, uh, his series of, of uh, lectures on the Sira, right? The, the life of yeah, Muhammad. He's got a, he's got a hundred lectures on the Sira. He's got other series that he's done. I mean, he's he's been around for years. And, and the reason I bring this up is he'll bring up some very difficult issues, right? Like he'll talk about the satanic verses. If you listen to him talk about that, it's amazing just how uh, well-versed he is in that area, right? And it, it's also an area where he mentions that there are difficulties here. He also mentions that there are difficulties when it comes to uh, Muhammad taking the wife of his adopted son, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he goes through these different attempts to deal with this. He shoots holes in certain ones. And then he comes up with what he considers to be a plausible and an acceptable Islamic way of understanding those things. And, and so my point here is he's, he's, he's very intelligent, uh, he's very well informed, and he has the sophistication to try and come up with things, even if we don't buy them, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason I bring that up is if anybody was going to be able to do this, uh, and uh, you know, one person that we would expect to be able to do so would be Yasser Qadi, uh, to account for the, the, the issue of the Quran's transmission and all these problems. Uh, if somebody was going to be able to at least spin a plausible theory, uh, he's one person I would think of. I would fully expect him to be able to do so. Like I said, he's well-educated, he's smart, he's rhetorically gifted. Uh, I've watched him do so on even you know, other difficult issues. Uh, you know, taking your own son's adopted wife, uttering verses from mm. Satan, 
you name it, uh, Yasser Qadi tries to tackle those issues. And, and so to me, this is extremely telling when he comes along and in response to uh, Muhammad Hijab, he says, I'd rather not talk about this. And then he even says it's foolish to talk about this in public and, and then says he's never talked about this issue in public. And then immediately in that context starts talking about the struggle of faith and doubt that he experienced uh, while he uh, was in university. Right. So most of us understand that this probably had something to do with his struggle of faith at that time. And, and I've heard other videos of Yasser Qadi uh, before this where he was talking about his doubts and also videos where he talks about uh, some issues with the traditional narrative. But he, he's not as full or as clear as he is in his interview with Muhammad Hijab. And by the way, the reason he's a bit more clear, although not as, uh, as clear as, as we could have hoped, the reason he's a bit more clear is because Muhammad Hijab, uh, you know, foolishly d decided to sort of press forward, right? And he, and he started pushing Yasser Qadi. I think he asked him three or four times, what would you write on, an em on a blank page, right? What would you write uh, if you had to? Would you write the Quran? Would it be the same thing that I c confessed today? Would it be the same thing that Muhammad and his companions recited then? And he says, aki, aki, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. And so uh, this is what created a whole uh, firestorm, right? Uh, here are two prominent Muslims, one who's engaged in uh, dawah, uh, who engages in apologetics and, and debate representing Islam, who has for years tr uh, touted the traditional narrative. He's admitting that that, that narrative is not true. Yasser Qadi comes along and says the Quran has holes in it. And by the way, I don't know if you saw it, but earlier, Ergo Sum, the nickname Ergo Sum, he, he uh, in, in reference to Yasser Qadi, uh, he started referring to Holy Quran, mm -hmm. right? H-O-L-E-Y, uh, -E uh, in, in reference to uh, Yasser Qadi's, the Quran, the narrative has holes in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's where we're at, and that's why, uh, that's why this is so significant. Not because we didn't know this stuff, but because now Muslims are being forced to admit it because, again, the evidence uh, is mounting, uh, and a lot of it is corroborating what was already there in Islamic sources, and it's undermining some of the traditional ways that Muslims have tried to account for that. Um, all right. Well, uh, I asked Anthony at the beginning to give us a quick summary of uh, what's been happening. And here we are, 50 minutes into the live stream. <laughs> he, he only interrupted me for 30 minutes of it. <laughs> hey, check this out, though. So, uh, so uh, notice, for decades, Muslim apologists and Muslim scholars lie to Muslims, telling them perfect preservation right down to the letter. For decades, we say that's not true. Read your own sources. It's just not true. And now we finally have Muslim scholars and apologists who are starting to admit that there are differences and so on. And we're saying, look, they're, they're actually right. You've got some problems here. Just admit that the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved. And, and, oh, we're here. I wasn't even talking. Anthony's talking, but check out the Muslim response from Muhammad Nasser. How's your dead father and his friend now, David? <laughs> that's that's the response, right? Uh, My dad's got nothing to do with the discussion. I just let's let's go. And how am I supposed to respond? How, I don't know. How's your dead prophet, Muhammad Nasser? How's your dead prophet? You know, the one who died wallowing in freakish misery after he was poisoned and he couldn't even walk and his feet were dangling behind him as they dragged him around like weekend at Bernie's. But uh, get, notice, notice, uh. no, no, just notice, ladies and gentlemen, right? It's Muslim scholars lie in order to keep Muslims deceived and ignorant. We tell them the truth. And when we tell them the truth, they lash out it in anger at us anger and hatred at us for telling them the truth. What is this religion? What is this? Go ahead, Anthony. And there were, we, we've got to get to some clips from uh, Mufti Abu Layth because he's just hilarious, mm. but go ahead. So, so this is actually about Mufti Abu Layth. So people may not have seen him yet unless they saw your video the other day where you, you have him uh, in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I actually watched a video. <laughs> you, may, you may not have seen this. You may not have seen this, but I have, there's a video of, of uh, Abu uh, Layth referring to you. And uh, uh, I just think this is funny in this context because we were talking about the unreliability of memory and, and uh, people repeating things and that sort of thing. Uh, not, not the complete unreliability, but just it's not you, you can't expect perfect preservation that way. Uh, but uh, uh, in this video, Abu Layth mentions you and then he says, I don't know if you guys know who he is. Uh, and then somebody in the 
uh, the crowd there, you can't see him because they're not on camera, but the person says, uh, he tried to kill his father. And then this other person says, no, 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 his father tried to kill him. And then somebody else yells oh, yeah. something else out. And, and, and the reason I, I just find this somewhat humorous because it's Abu Layth, we're about to watch him in a minute. But here you have these different people uh, shouting out different things that they heard, mm -hmm. right, but apparently didn't remember correctly and are reporting differently. And that's not all that surprising uh, in light of what we also see is true in the case of the Quran itself, not being preserved completely yeah. accurately yeah. down through the ages of uh, transmission. Actually, actually, along those lines, as a matter of fact, here's another perfect example of that, right? <laughs> it's it's funny how this ties in perfectly with what you're just saying. Here's the next comment from Muhammad Nasser. David, remember your debate with Zakir Nyek? You are finished. You are finished. You are finished. <laughs> Anthony, you, do you remember my debate with Zakir Nyek? No, I, I wish I had, though, because that would have been, uh, you know, uh, it would have been awful. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Zucker Nyck has never once faced an actual Christian debater in his entire, in his entire career. You guys should know that. But notice, uh, wow. Uh, and the point here, uh, along the lines of memory, I, I, want, I just wanted to mention briefly because Muslims are saying... Um, I mean, uh, some people, some non-Muslims were saying, but, you know, there are people who have photographic memories and there are people who, uh, you know, can memorize tons of stuff. Uh, that's true. But here's what you find in Islam. The people who had the best memories in the early Muslim sources were dismissed, right? They had to reject what they, let, let, let me go ahead and give you an example. This is from, and, Sah and this, killed. yeah, this is, this is from Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5005. Check this out. And those and and this name right here, Ubay ibn Kab, you should recognize this if you watched the Yasser Qadi clip because um, Yasser Qadi refers to Ubay ibn Kab as the master of the Quran. Watch what Ubay says. So Sahih al Bukhari, number five thousand five. Umar said so. Umar, the second one of Muhammad's closest companions, Muhammad's father-in-law, because Muhammad married uh, Umar, one of Umar's daughters, and uh, the, the second of the rightly guided caliphs, uh, one of Muhammad's closest companions. Umar said. Ubay was the best of us in the recitation of the Quran. Yet we leave some of what he recites. Ubay says, I have taken it from the mouth of Allah's messenger and will not leave it for anything whatsoever. This is Umar saying, Ubay's the best at reciting the Quran, but we have to leave off some of what he recites. Who was the best memorizer of the Quran? Ubay ibn Kaab. Muslims later Muslims Muslims later on would would forget stuff and then Ubay would be quoting the original Ubay would be quoting the original how he memorized because he had the best memory and the Muslims are going to him go why are you reciting this with this extra stuff in here and Ubay saying I got that directly from the mouth of Muhammad I'm not leaving that and they're saying but it's different it's different from what we've memorized and so there are people saying yeah but some people have great memories yeah but the people with great memories were overpowered and overcome by the people who had lesser memories and memorized the Quran with stuff missing from it. That's what happened in the history of Islam. So it, this 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 all goes back down to once the, once a once a larger mob comes to view something as the perfectly preserved Quran, someone else who comes along and says, "Wait a minute, I remember exactly how I got it from Muhammad." They'll say, "What are you talking about? Get out of here with this stuff." So that's the uh, that's the ongoing problem. All right, should we check out some uh, should we check out some stuff from? <laughs> Let's do from, it from the Mufti. All right, guys. So I have a clip from uh, from Mufti Abu Layth. Um, I had only ever seen him once before. I clicked on it because he was commenting on uh, the situation with Yasser Qadi. I've only I'd only clicked on a uh, Mufti uh, Abu Layth video once before when uh, I was looking at, at Shabir because he had Shabir on a live stream with him and they were discussing the age of Aisha. So I wanted to see if, if Shabir's position had changed over the years. But uh, let's go ahead and check out some of this because he see, he see, I'm sure you would agree, Tony, but I mean, we're always laughing and joking and stuff like this. And a lot of other people always come across as angry and stuff. And uh, Mufti here seems like, uh, seems like he actually uh, has a sense of humor and would be fun to be around. All right, let's, let's go ahead and check out some of this. Now, moving back to the topic why were we even discussing this? Those of you that know, this was uh, this is what it was all about. 
that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything. Masala they'll moment. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar and then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhtutat and then and then. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Okay? So, many of you may be familiar what Sheikh Huzur Qazi Saab, Qazi Saab did. Is he went on a um, on an interview with, uh, with Muhammad Hijab and what he decided to do in that interview is uh, no, he never decided. To be fair, to be fair to him, uh, Muhammad Hijab sprung on him this question, this controversy to do with the Quran not being preserved. What is this about? You know, because how do we have these different manuscripts or these different variants, and what's going on? And Yasser Qadi Saab, what he does is he decides to just be very open <laughs> and he decides to say well you know what i'm gonna just pour my heart out and say that we've got huge <laughs> problems with the quran yeah but then what makes it worse is he doesn't give the solution like he keeps saying this is something we shouldn't be discussing in front of people shouldn't be discussing this in front of people but then he carries on discussing it <laughs> but only discussing the problem part yeah and when it comes to the solution he says uh well you know this is really complicated why don't you go on my course right so why don't you go on my course and you know i had 100 people on it and join my paid course and what i'll do is i'll take you through the answer <laughs> but there was a <laughs> hang on let me pause it right there uh well, well uh yeah we'll 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 uh we're, we're gonna we're gonna try and get through a, a good uh a good portion of uh of this clip from, by the way, what do you, what do you guys, uh, what do you guys think of uh, Mufti uh, Abu Layth? Uh, he cracks me. It, he's hilarious the way he, uh, he starts laughing his way through this, and and it's funny because you have all kinds of people who are critical of Yasser Qadi, but they're coming across they're coming across as like really angry, like I I will destroy you. I I have to destroy and refute you now for for the damage you're, you're causing. And and then you've got a. Uh, and then you've got this Mufti here, and he's just uh, he's talking about it, and he's, he's making he's making some cool points, and uh, and you know, but he's clear, he's, he's clearly not. He doesn't look like he wants to go and you know, like beat up Yasser Qadi or something like that. He's just like look 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 what you've brought on yourself here for, by by saying these things. But uh, right there, he's uh, that that's kind of the heart of the matter. What he just what he just talked about right there that. Yasser Qadi saying, guys, we have all of these problems. Remember what he was saying? Uh, this is no joke, brothers. This is no joke. I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. But man, if you go up against these Western scholars and you say these things that we tell you, they will laugh you out of the room. They're going to think you're a complete idiot for saying these things. It's, it's such a problem. This is no joke. This is no joke. They're, they, don't, they, don't, they don't respect the red line. They just keep crossing it. The answers that we give would never stand up against them. He actually compares... Uh, the, the Muslim scholars and apologists and their explanation to the emperor in the emperor's new clothes, the guy who walked around naked and was so stupid that he didn't realize he was naked. And the Western scholars in this analogy, the Western scholars are the ones who go, what are you talking about? You're naked. You don't have any clothes on. And he's saying, that's what it's, that's what it's like. And so he's like in panic mode, but then, <laughs> but I can't tell you the, I can't tell you the solution. And, and going back to what Anthony was saying uh, before we started that, you would think that assuming there's there is a problem, right? There's this there, there, the, the problem that Yasser Qadi was talking about is you have the the ahruf and then you have the the kirat, and what's the relationship between those two, right? What's the relationship between those, and how does this relate to things like Uthman burning all the Qurans and putting out an official Quran? How does all of this work together? And he's saying. We have our explanations, we have all these different explanations, and they just don't fit. Some of them fit more than others, but none of them really fits, and we cannot, those cannot be used to answer the questions of these non-Muslim academics who are poking holes in our explanation. I don't know what to do. And as Anthony was pointing out, 
This is Sheikh Yasser Qadi, right? He's been educated to the the heights of what Islam can offer, and he's also a, a, a crossover Western academic. He went to Yale and studied this stuff, right? So he's got a foot in both worlds, and this guy's been lecturing for years. He does these massive lecture series on the, the life of Muhammad, and he says... We don't know. Take my course. I'll kind of get you. I'll, I'll kind of, you know, try to take you through some of the problems. But but take my course. And but we can't discuss this in public. And what's what's amazing is going back to what I was saying earlier, the Muslims in the chat who still don't think there is a problem. They're just, like, oh, no, no, no. He's only referring to some differences of pronunciation. and So on. really, you, you don't think he would have just said that? You don't think he would have clarified that? By the way, guys, I'm just talking about some different pronunciations of the same word because, you know, it's like Irish and, and American English. They sound a little different. That's all I'm talking about. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about that. He would not be in panic mode if that's all he meant. Muhammad Hijab would not have had to delete that entire portion of the discussion if that's all Yasser Qadi had meant. If, if, even assuming that people didn't understand it, Yasser Qadi could have come out right afterwards and said, oh, oh you guys thought it was talking about problems with the with the Quran and so no, just different pronunciations. That's all I was talking about, right? He was in panic mode. He deleted, he, del he, he had YouTube take down. He filed copyright, copy, copyright paperwork against me for something that was that's completely legal and protected, that video will eventually go back up, even if it has, even if I have to go to court over it. Um, but he had YouTube take down all I did. I took all those little parts where he's saying we can't say this in public. This is too dangerous. This will destroy the face of Muslims. That's the basic idea. And uh, I took these clips, and I, you know, after each one, I would have Jack Nicholson going, "You can't handle the truth," because that's what he was telling Muslims. He's saying, "Muslims, you can't handle this. You're not ready for this. I know that you've been raised all your life." To believe perfect preservation right down to the letter. And if you find out what's actually going on, so many of you are going to leave Islam. And I, I don't want to be the cause of that. So we cannot talk about this. But then what's he say? So if you're really interested in this stuff, you have to take my course. And that's what uh, Mufti uh, Abu Layth here just finds hilarious, right? So, guys, there's this problem that might destroy Islam. And if you want the answer, take my paid course. And uh, <laughs> that's brilliant, by the way. You and me should do that, Anthony. We should, make, we, we should make a video. <laughs> Guys, there's something that could destroy Christianity and bring Christianity to its knees if it gets out. And just so you know, uh, yeah, you have to take our paid course if you want the answer to it. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is funny stuff. And and he mentions uh, Yasser Qadi starts pouring his heart out about <laughs> That's about hilarious. Issue, That's right? hilarious the way he puts uh, stuff, right? And, I'm going to pour my heart out. Yeah. <laughs> And that's going to tie into something in a bit. But um, but here I just want to go back to something else just just in terms of uh, Abu Layth and, and part of what I think accounts for why he's a bit more laid back and not so intense as, as some of these other guys are. One thing is you can tell very uh, easily that Abu Layth is not a Salafi, right? He, yeah. Uh, th there are a number of things that, that show that he's not a Salafi just from what we've already seen and some of what we're going to see. In the first place, he doesn't have the beard, right? He's got the goatee going on. He's obviously trimming things. She's shaving and so forth. Definite no-no as far as Salafism goes. Uh, also, in a minute, I, I, I don't know if you have this part of the clip in there, but while he's uh, quoting Kadi or about to quote him, uh, there's going to be music playing, right? Because he's yeah. sort of dramatizing this part about Yasser Kadi pouring out his heart. <laughs> and so he has this music playing. Obviously another no-no when it comes to Salafism. So there are a number of things that stand out that show that he's not a Salafi. Mm -hmm. But this is really interesting, and uh, in a sense, I've been holding out on you. Uh, the other day, I was watching some uh, Abu Layth videos before this, you know, before uh, we were going to talk about all this. And uh, he's got this thing. In fact, in this video, at one point, he refers to Bukhari Gate. And I don't know if you have the, that part in the clip here, but most people will hear that and think, what does that refer to, Bukhari Gate? He keeps saying it. Well, he's actually referring to this project that he has to show he's not he's not a Quran only Muslim, mm -hmm. but he doesn't accept the idea that Bukhari is just automatically Sahih, right? He thinks there are narr uh, narrations in there that are just patently false. He doesn't believe it should be put on the level of the Quran, mm -hmm. which is the standard approach, right? The, the the Sunnah and the Quran are both equally authoritative, not in the sense that they're both the the literal verbal dictation of Allah, but both are inspired, right? The Quran is Allah's literal speech. The Sunnah is Muhammad's inspired utterances, his res inspired responses, and so forth, to various uh, situations. So, in in, in classical Sunnism, uh, those two sources of authority are are uh, uppermost, right? They're the pinnacle mm -hmm. of authority in Islam. 
But Abu Laith actually calls that into question, and he has these videos, which he calls Bukhari Gate, where he's exposing what he thinks are obviously problematic hadith. And, mm -hmm. and one of the hadith, just to give an example of this, and, and I'm actually curious about this because if you read the English translation, now he's, he's reading the Arabic, and he's showing you on the screen. He's putting his copy of the Arabic uh, edition of Bukhari on the screen. He's recounting a hadith, uh, one among many that he, he goes through, uh, which he says, this is just downright disrespectful, can't be true of our prophet, right? Uh, so he's reasoning like a Muslim. He, he's thinking Muhammad's the paradigm of, of uh, uh, conduct. But he thinks that uh, of a different, he, he thinks of what, what's good independently of Muhammad, in other words. In other words, this is good, so if Muhammad's the pattern of conduct, he must have done X. But since the hadith attributes Y to him, that can't be a true hadith. That's his way of reasoning. But the, and, the hadith, and, and, and by, 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 says, the, by the way, I did get I did gather that from uh, uh, from the uh, the portion that I watched from one video where they were talking about uh, Aisha, and uh, it's interesting because uh, Shabir Ali in that video I'll be making a video about this, but Shabir Ali in that video said um, a nine year old girl is just not ready for marriage, right? And so it's clear that that's what was guiding his reinterpretation of the text. But him saying that, but but. Uh, 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 the, the Mufti there, he, he was commenting on this and he was saying um, and he was saying uh, uh, that he believes that since there were accusations against Aisha of possibly committing adultery and stuff, that the that her um, her age may have been exaggerated down. Like there's no time for that. Right. There, there, there's no time for for any of that. She was she was too young. She wouldn't have been out, uh, you know, doing anything with with other people and stuff. So apparently he has that kind of that kind of view. But. Yeah, so you're saying he does that with uh, with multiple passages in Bukhari. Yeah, so so listen to this. There's actually two examples now that I want to give. Uh, but one, very briefly, is, is there's a hadith where, uh, where Muhammad uh, goes to a uh, woman's house. This is a Muslim, according to Abu Layth. And in the, the standard translation, it says that he goes to the woman and he says, give yourself to me. And, but, but the way it's, well, excuse me, the, the way it's worded in the standard translation is uh, give yourself to me in marriage, right? Uh, he's asking her to become his wife. Uh, and then uh, she says, uh, should a princess marry, uh, uh, or it says, should a princess marry an ordinary man? And then it says that Muhammad reached out to, to console her or calm her and, and told her that, you know, he's a, he's a good man or whatever. Uh, he's the servant of Allah and so forth. Uh, but in the actual translation that Abu Layth gives, it says that Muhammad uh, goes to this woman and says, give yourself to me. In other words, he wants her to pleasure him. And then she said, should, should a queen give herself to a loser? Right. That, that's what it literally says, according to him. And then it says that Muhammad reached out to touch her, meaning to actually fondle her in some sense. And then she rebuffs him and says, uh, I seek refuge in Allah from you. Right. This is how the woman replies. And so Abu Layth, reading it from the Arabic, seems to have a very different uh, understanding of it than what we have in the English version of that account. But the same thing with Aisha. He's really ridiculing some of the, the reasoning when it comes to Aisha. He says, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, uh, you know, he says, how could Aisha even be old enough to consent to marriage at six years old? Right. And then he points to these other hadiths where it says that Muhammad taught that when people became uh, 10 years old, then uh, brother and sister could no longer sleep with each other, he said, because they used to sleep together naked. But, but uh, at the age of 10, then they had to be separated. He says, but what, Aisha can marry Muhammad at six years old? Uh, she, has, she can consent at six years old? She could, you know, have relations with him at nine? And, and they weren't even separated until 10 normally? I mean, he just rips into these things. So, so he's not uncritical of certain things. And so I think it shows in some sense why he's just not so uh, uptight, right? He... Uh, he, he doesn't take some of the, uh, you know, the strident or stringent approach to some of these things that uh, other Muslims do. Uh, now, I think that's hugely problematic, as I, as I, I know you would, uh, because I mean, you've, you've responded to the problem of, uh, now, he's not, again, he's not exactly a Quran-only Muslim. He's not rejecting all Hadith. But as soon as you start really whittling away at the, at the Hadith and undermining uh, their trustworthiness, you then start to have huge problems, right? Because now we don't know how to account for all sorts of things. Uh, and, and, the you know, again, the same people who give us the Hadith are the people who supposedly give us the Quran, mm -hmm. right? And so these, these change of narrations, if you start uh, eroding our confidence in them, all of a sudden 
uh, you know, the Quran itself goes with it. You, you can't have the one without the other. Um, yeah, the so. uh, and 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 the 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 problem there is, and and by the way, that's, I mean, it's it's actually not an entirely unreasonable position to say, guys, these sources are really late. Um, they're they're put together in an atmosphere where people were fabricating stories like it was a sport, and I just don't trust this. I just don't trust this stuff. So uh, you know, I have to cast doubt upon them. That is entirely reasonable. But yeah, that, what do you do then, right? I mean, here, here are your options. One, you can. I mean, so notice if you if you go that route, then basically you've got this method that Muslims came up with. We we have this method of you know it's not criticism, and this is how we get to the most reliable stories. Well, you get to that stuff, and and Muslims want to throw that stuff out, right? So I don't believe that this I don't believe that this is uh, right. And so notice once you do that, then you're basically saying that the method that our scholars came up with is not reliable. And we've got all sorts of false stories that passes the criteria of our method, but which we still reject as, as false. Well, what other method do you have? The, the, the alternative method would be to take an approach that Western historians would take, right? Actual historians, right? There, you would be looking at, you know, various historical principles. You'd be looking at what are your earliest sources? What do you have that's multiply attested that that is that that comes from, you know, from from different kinds of sources? Um, principle of embarrassment. Uh, they, so notice there they would say the more embarrassing it is to your case, the more likely it is to be true. And the more favorable it is to your case, the more likely it is to be made up. And so they would be applying principles like that. But then all of a sudden, you now you have to grant the satanic verses. You have to grant all these different things. And so the, the, the alternative to one of those routes is just skepticism and just saying, we don't, we don't know. We don't know about our prophet. But then that, that's so, notice you have, a pro, you have a huge problem wherever you go. If you want to take the, the current Muslim sources and this methodology seriously, you got all kinds of moral problems with Muhammad. If you want to take the approach of a, of a non-Muslim historian, you end up with all kinds of problems. Um, if you reject either one of those pro approaches, looks like you're just stuck with skepticism and you can't know anything about your prophet and don't tell us it's a true religion. And don't tell us that we should trust the Quran when all the people who are lying about your prophet are the ones who are, are, the ones who are uh, preserving the Quran. So it's just, you, you have a big mess here. All right, should we watch some more of uh, Abu Layth? Yes, let's do it. All right. We're going back <laughs> to the Mufti. Point in there where Muhammad Hijab says to him that, look, if I gave you a blank Mus'haf, a blank Quran, and you can use any Mus'haf you want, but you have to rewrite the Quran, would you rewrite it with pretty much what we have today? And for some reason, <laughs> Right, so what happened is after this uh, whole episode of Muhammad Hijab kind of pressing him and him deciding to have this moment of epiphany and transparency and I want to just pour my heart out to the world, right? this backfired so badly, if people flipped, the mob flipped. Worse than that, uh, Muhammad Hijab realized that, oh my God, this is backfired on him as well, right? So people turn on Muhammad Hijab. What does Muhammad Hijab do? He turns on Yasser al-Qadi. He has a, if I can, let me just see, where was the, uh, I had it here somewhere. Right, here it is. So, this is a, a part of Muhammad Hijab's Facebook post, he decides to make a Facebook post saying that Yasser Qadi against him after the interview, he will be refuted. Huh? He will be refuted. Mm, boy, you're finished. <laughs> uh, let me pause it right there. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a pretty decent... Uh... Uh, not a, not a direct impression of Muhammad Hijab, but more along the lines of the attitude, and 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 you can see, uh, 
later on that he has a real problem with uh, with both Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Hijab and, and kind of their entire way of doing things that we have to go out and refute all of these people that are, you know, in error on, on all of these things, because apparently they've, they've come after uh, Mufti Abu Layth as well. And so he's pointing out that this attitude of going out and challenging everyone and I have to refute this and refute that, that that's kind of it's kind of coming back upon them now. Now everyone's jumping all over them because their fans are all these people that we have to refute. Uh, we have to go out and refute everything and we have to go and destroy everything and everything that that is that is in the way and so on. And uh, and now that you have a disagreement, now they're refuting each other and attacking each other. And so this is uh, this looks like what he finds uh, pretty amusing here. Any thoughts before we go on, Anthony? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, yeah. So one of the things he he, he points out uh, again, I don't know which clip you're uh, if you're going to have this in or not, but uh, I, 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 I took I took I took uh, I took the entire uh, nineteen. I, I cut out like okay the risque okay. a little risque thing right, right there. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Um, so okay then. So then he'll probably bring it up, and maybe I don't need to. But uh, uh, he is going to talk about uh, the fact that. Uh, you know, it was foolish of Yasser Qadi to go on with Muhammad Hijab and assume that he's a friend and could just uh, conduct a conversation on that level. Uh, and then he quotes a verse uh, or a statement uh, in Arabic, which uh, I guess means something like, uh, you know, be careful who you trust, you know, uh, uh, as your companions, uh, because, uh, you know, they'll eventually turn and devour you. And, uh, you know, it reminds me, though, of, of something that has been observed by others with respect to, you know, things going on politically. Uh, you know, often we get involved in certain things in Muslim countries when if we just left them alone, uh, in many ways, they would they would turn on each other and ignore us. Uh, but we often draw their fire, right, because we, we go and, and uh, uh, insert ourselves politically in some of these things and, and then become the, the uh, object of attention. Well, the same thing is uh, true when it comes to apologetically or doctrinally or practically in Islamic circles, right? Leave Muslims alone and they'll devour each other, right? And that's, that's I think, the, the dynamic that uh, Abu Layth is observing, that these guys are, are given to that sort of thing as part of their, their tradition, their methodology, uh, because for many, many years, uh, Yasser Qadi was a Salafi. And it's, I'm not just limiting it to Salafism, but, but the reason I bring this up is because— uh, uh, Muhammad Hijab is a Salafi. Yasser Qadi was a Salafi for many years. The people who are most critical of Yasser Qadi now are Salafis because he's he's backed off on some of their their uh, tenets. And uh, Yasser Qadi apparently hasn't stopped in many ways uh, having the same attitude of critiquing people. Right? Uh, he does try and, and present a bit of a more uh, tolerant approach when it comes to certain things. In fact, that's one of the more humorous parts of this whole thing. Right. Uh, I, I don't want to steal his thunder, but he's going to talk about how how uh, Yasser Qadi uh, wants to avoid controversy on on certain topics. But apparently yeah, that, that's it. That's an important uh, part as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just leave that for, yeah. for the clip. A uh, qu couple quick comments right. right here. John Crypto says, how can you be a light of the love of Christ by insulting nonbelievers? You catch that, ladies and gentlemen, we should be ashamed of ourselves. We are we are not being a light of love of, of the love of Christ by insulting non-believers. Now now Anthony, am, am I wrong here? But didn't Jesus, who clearly exhibited the light of the love of Christ, insult non-believers? Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite uh, statements is when Jesus says, "Go tell that old fox," referring to Herod. Right? Uh, somebody brings a, a report to him uh, regarding uh, Herod and his machinations. And Jesus uh, tells them to go reply, and he refers to Herod as an old fox, meaning he's some, you know, it's like us saying he's a sly devil. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly not an endearing mm -hmm. term, not something you'd expect him to say of somebody in a position of power, especially if that was contrary to the dictates of love, right? Uh, but, I mean, uh, I mean, we can give uh, examples of verbal expressions over mm -hmm. and over again. Yeah. Jesus, right? He, yeah. he speaks in less than superlative terms of people. Yeah, you, but, you, you, uh, you, you whitewash tombs, you brood of vipers, you snakes. Now, look, he, he's insulting right here, right? He's insulting. Um, and I don't know. Maybe sometimes we need to slow down for people and explain what some of those terms mean. I mean, mm -hmm. because uh, it's almost as if, they're just glossing over those things as, they, as though they aren't what they are. Yeah, they, tune, yeah, they tune them out. They're, they're, they're clearly insults. So how is Jesus? Could you imagine John Crypto being there? Jesus, 
How can you be a light of the love of yourself by insulting these non-believers? Uh, John Crypto, I'll, I'll break it down for you right now. Uh, you would interpret insults as unloving. I would view certain insults as unloving. But I would view some insults as completely loving. If you're telling people what they need to hear, guess what? Jesus was, in every one of those cases, Jesus was saying what people needed to hear. Some ideas are really stupid. They're stupid and they need to be called stupid. They need to be, they're so stupid that they need to be made fun of. When, when someone comes along and says, perfect preservation right down to the letter, and we go through their sources and we find missing, you know, entire chapters came up missing, large passages came up missing, verses are eaten by a sheep. There are manuscripts that have tens of thousands of differences. Um, when we see that and, and people are running around, perfect preservation right down to the letter, you call that stupid. You call that claim idiotic until it finally sinks in. And that's not hateful, that's loving. What's hateful is not, not telling people the truth not telling people that these claims are ridiculous because you're basically saying these claims are completely false and you're all being misled and you're all being deceived, but you know, I don't want to hurt your feelings. So I, I won't bother to tell you how bad and silly and ridiculous these claims are. So uh, differences here. And here's a, here, here's, here's a quick example from three idiots, very aptly named three idiots says, David, <laughs> so the, <laughs> he's a, he's commenting on the the uh, the principle of embarrassment. David, if scripture has embarrassing statements is more authentic according to you, then why you throw away Gospel of Thomas, which portrays Jesus as misogynistic, saying 114. Uh three idiots, again, very appropriately named. One, you didn't understand the the principle of embarrassment at all. Two, you definitely don't understand the Gospel of Thomas. And and third, you 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 <laughs> Jesus being misogynistic was not was not embarrassing to the people who were writing the Gospel of Thomas, right? So uh, one, the principle of embarrassment does not say, oh, if something's embarrassing, it's as good as gold, right? I could say something embarrassing or insulting about Christianity or Islam or anything right now. It doesn't mean it's it's his, it doesn't mean it's historically valid, right? That's not the point. The point is, if you're looking at claims. Of the, of the adherence of that religion, right? So if you're talking about Muslims sharing stories about Muhammad and claiming that they got this from Muhammad, or if you're talking about Christians, Jesus followers, making claims about Jesus, the historian looks at these and he says, well, if I have a story about Jesus or a story about Muhammad that's coming from the followers, well, if it's something really positive, I have to question that. It could be true. It could, it could be totally true, but... I have to think about what reason they would have to invent this, right? Because if they have a good reason to invent that, I might want to take a closer look and see maybe they invented this. If it's something really embarrassing to them and they're trying to explain it away, then that actually weighs in favor of authenticity. Because if there's no good reason for someone to invent something, then, well, there's no reason to invent it. So you go back to the earliest strata of uh, Islam. They're all saying that Muhammad received revelations from the devil. Muslims today, that never happened. Why? Because it's it's embarrassing. Guess what? It was embarrassing back then too. That's why they they were trying to explain it away. They're trying to turn it into a positive in a positive direction. Well, guess what? It was clearly embarrassing to them. So if it's embarrassing, does it seem likely that they would have made it up? That they would have said, "Hey, you know what? Let's make up a story about Muhammad delivering revelations from the devil." No. It doesn't make sense for Muslims to invent it. If non-Muslims had invented it, it doesn't make sense that Muslims would have included this in their story. They would say, what are you talking about? The only explanation for why this is in the Muslim sor sources is that they knew it happened, right? That, that's the only explanation. Whereas if you take something like Muhammad's miracle claims, we can have believable miracle claims. But when your earliest source, the Quran, says that Muhammad didn't perform miracles, and then the farther you go along, the more miracle claims you have, it's clear that people are making these things up and that they had a reason. Why? Because wherever they went and they said, Muhammad's a prophet, Christians and Jews would say, what miracles did he perform? And at first it was none, just the Quran. And Christians and Jews laughed that out of the room, right? Uh, but as time went on, more and more, oh yeah, he was shooting water out of his fingers and we were thirsty. It's all kinds of nonsense, right? So it's clear they had a reason to make that up. And, and, and there's no good reason to think that the, the historical Muhammad actually performed miracles. You know, the earliest source actually denies it. And so that's how the principle of embarrassment is working. So there's that. Then there's the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is a forgery. No one thinks the Gospel of Thomas is authentic. No one thinks that Thomas sat down and wrote the Gospel of Thomas. 
It is a forgery, right? It's like the Gospel of Barnabas, which is even long after that, right? It's a forgery. People don't say, oh, the Gospel of Thomas contains something that we don't like and that we find embarrassing. Therefore, we're throwing it out. The Gospel of Thomas, <laughs> the Gospel of Thomas is thrown out because it is the most obvious forgery in all of history, uh, apart from the Gospel of Barnabas. And so, and, and the Quran. Yeah. And so, and, uh, and apart from that, portraying Jesus as misogynistic, it's a forgery, right? It, it's, it's, a, it's a forgery. So, dude, by all means, stop embarrassing yourself. Stop hearing something for the first time and then trying to use it in an attack when you have no clue what you're talking about because you just end up embarrassing yourself. Anthony, anything you wanted to add before we go into more Mufti Abu Layth? Well, just one, one thing about the, the insult thing. I mean, I, I was thinking back on our conversation. I'm thinking, gosh, at this point, I don't recall insulting anyone, right? I mean, I, I think it's kind of interesting that he would say that because if he goes back and looks at the videos where we really dig into people, uh, gosh, I can't imagine what he's going to say then. <laughs> yeah, hey, here hey, we haven't called anybody. Here, here. Uh, in fact, in fact, it's Abu Layth in this video who calls each an idiot, Yeah. Uh, right? But I don't recall, I don't think we've said that about any of them, although... Truth be told, there, there's definitely some idiotic things going on here. Yeah, there is. And here you have, uh, uh, <laughs> listen to this here, you have John Crypto. This guy's hilarious. David, He's this back, is huh? this is not the way of truth. And then his next comment, do not defame the Lord by misrepresenting him. Win through love only. <laughs> <laughs> misrepresenting him. <laughs> John Crypto. So everyone... Just so you know, Jesus did not say, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He didn't call them snakes. He didn't call them a brood of vipers. He didn't call them whitewashed tombs because John Crypto has erased those things from his Bible. When the Apostle Paul, when the Apostle Paul ran into Elymas the sorcerer, who was trying to lead people astray from the gospel, he didn't say, you, you, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, because that would be unloving. And Paul wouldn't have been a good reflection of, uh, of the, the love of Christ. So that didn't happen. That didn't happen. These guys, these guys we read about in scripture, they never said things that would hurt people's feelings because that's always inappropriate. That's always inappropriate. It's not the way. John Crypto says, this is not the way. This is not the way, ladies and gentlemen. You should just let people go on believing complete falsehoods, believing some of the stupidest things anyone has ever foisted upon them and never expose them because you'll hurt their feelings and they'll be insulted. You got that? You got that, Anthony? Have you learned your lesson, Anthony? We, Finally. We need the we need the, uh, the 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 JCV, the John Crypto version of the Bible. He can go ahead and uh, <laughs> erase all the parts that he doesn't like. Until then, until you come out with your uh, authoritative uh, John Crypto version, John Crypto, we'll go ahead and, and stick with following the um... <laughs> John Crypto says, you are not the Lord, David, not an apostle. Now, wait a minute. You're telling us to follow the, the example of Jesus' love. <laughs> but we're not the Lord. <laughs> do, do you notice? Follow follow Jesus' example of love. Okay, well, what about when he would expose falsehood and 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 expose stupid things and stupid stupid patterns of thinking and make fun of them? What about when he makes fun of them? What you can't do that. You're not him. <laughs> you see this? In other words, in other words, here's John Crypto. See, because he's doing the same thing with Jesus that he's doing with the Bible. Just take the parts of Jesus that I like, and yeah, you imitate those. But if it's something I don't like, then don't imitate that. That you're not him. This is oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> oh boy. And, and, you know, it's funny, John Crypto, I can't believe he's making fun of me. This is not Christ-like for him to be making fun of me. And he, he shouldn't be making fun of me for completely misrepresenting and distorting Christianity and attacking Jesus and the apostles because that's what you're doing, John. Yeah. That's, By the way... I just want to be clear. That's what you're doing. When you say, it's wrong and immoral, not a good example of the love of Christ to say mean things and to insult people, you just attack Jesus. You just attack the Apostle Paul. You just attack the Apostle Peter. And that, but you don't, you don't, don't make fun of me for doing that. No, I, I will make fun of you because you're saying stupid things in public. All right. So anything else, Anthony? Oh, yeah, just ahead. quickly. I'm, th I'm thinking, first of all, if, 
if we can't follow Jesus, yep. because his example clearly goes against uh, his strictures. Got to follow John uh, Crypto. Crypto's strictures. Crypto is right. So th- then, then we should follow the apostles. Well, we can't follow the apostles because of John Crypto's strictures. <laughs> so who are we left with, right? I assume the same rule goes for the prophets, right? We can't follow Jesus. We can't follow the apostles. We can't follow the prophets. Oh, no, you definitely are not well, following which, Elijah or anyone else. No, wait a minute. Yeah, but 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 guess what? We still have plenty to appeal to when it comes to uh, this sort of thing, because the Psalms were given to be on the lips of all of God's people, right? They were to be sung by uh, God's people. They were to be memorized. But the Psalms are full of invectives and rhetoric uh, registered towards unbelievers. I won't tick all of them off, but uh, you know, just think of uh, you know Psalms where it says, for example, that. Uh, those who worship mute idols will be like them, right? In other words, mute, right? You'll be uh, just, uh, you know, their gods can't, they have eyes, but they can't see, ears, but they can't hear, feet, but they cannot walk, you know, and, and those who worship dumb idols uh, are going to be just like them. That, I mean, that, that's, again, that's uh, sarcasm and, and, and wit uh, in its highest. So, uh, you know, you're, you're not really salvaging anything here in terms of your makeshift rhetoric by trying to excise certain parts of the Bible as being irrelevant or what have you. Stop, stop quoting scripture. Stop looking at That's not where we go to for our behavior. We go to John Crypto and his church where everyone is super nice and loving and would never hurt anyone's feelings at all. They would never tell people. They would never, if they, if, well, if, uh, if they saw someone walking off a cliff, they would never yell, hey, you idiot, you're about to walk off a cliff. Be careful. They would never, because that might hurt his feelings. <laughs> they just let him walk off because that's loving. That's loving, Tony. So you got a lot. You got a lot to learn about uh, about love there, Tony. <laughs> All right, we we ready to check out some more uh, Abu? Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, John Crypto says his name is Michael, so I guess he's being cryptic about his name, just like uh, apparently the Bible's being cryptic on what's appropriate to say to non-believers. All right. More Mufti Abu Leith and his awesome laugh. <laughs> He will be refuted. This is what. So Muhammad Hijab decides to, you know what, let's just turn on him. This bichara had come on there. And you know something, this <laughs> Yasir Qadi had come on there and thought, you know what, I'm going to have a heart to heart. <laughs> he decided to come on there and do a heart to heart. Little does he know that Muhammad Hijab turns it on him and says, "If he, I think he's being a deviant, and if he's going to be a deviant, we're going to refute him. We're going we're going to turn on him." And this is who he, by the way. Yasser Qadi would never agree to come and have a dialogue with me. I had asked him, let's have a dialogue. No, no, no. I would never backstab any, any of my guests. I wouldn't do that. Not my style. You know. <laughs> hey, uh, I just want to pause it real quick uh, before we, before we uh, continue there, because uh, um, he's pointing out that Yasser Qadi would never have a dialogue with uh, Mufti Abu Leith. That... <laughs> Anthony... <laughs> Anthony, isn't this exactly the sort of guy who would be fun to have a dialogue with, right? Someone who's actually... <laughs> he's not angry. He's he's having a good time. It would seem that this is the type of guy you'd want to have a dialogue with. Instead, Yasser Qadi goes, let me go on with Muhammad Hijab, who's going to end my career. <laughs> <laughs> and and then say he's gonna threaten and then he, he threatens to refute me if I'm if I'm off on something because we've we've uh, created this culture where everyone has to everyone has uh, Muslims have to just keep going after each other nonstop. Uh, any thoughts on that before we yeah, go? Yeah, it, it, well, it'd be interesting uh, to me to know why that's the case. Now we already know it's the case because Abu Layth says he's tried to do that, right? So yeah. uh, for some reason Yasser Qadi wouldn't do it. One could guess maybe it's because he doesn't have as many views. Uh, Muhammad Hijab has a bigger platform, but it's anybody's guess, right? I don't know why. Well, I, I, th- is, I, I think is, uh, I think I think I think he comments on that. I think because they 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 view him as a he's 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 Sunni, but they want him to like stop saying he's even uh, Sunni. 
uh, something I think something along those lines. I could be off on that, but I think yeah, 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 yeah he's yeah. from. I think Yasser Kadi wants to stick with certain people who are uh, who are close to him. I guess. Yeah, I mean, but but part of the problem there is obviously Yasser Kadi has moved away from the more extreme form that is held by Mohammed Hijab, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm thinking here not just in terms of. Uh, I mean, he's still, uh, you know professes faith in the Quran, in the Sunnah, and all that sort of thing. Uh, but he doesn't hold to the same Akita, the same approach to theology as uh, Muhammad Hijab. There, there are stark differences. He doesn't hold to some of the same practices and so forth. So I, I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, the other day I heard Yasser Qadi being criticized by quite a number of uh, Salafis uh, because he was wishy-washy when it came to the had punishments, for example, mm-hmm. Uh, should uh, people be uh, killed for committing adultery? And Yasser Qadi made it sound as though this was open to question uh, and that it was something that was imported into Islam in the medieval period, even mm-hmm. though he knows full well that it wasn't, right? But he, mm-hmm. he sort of insinuates this to this audience. Uh, so I, I'm just pointing that out to say it's interesting because he does have definite differences with Muhammad Hijab. Uh, maybe, though, he's thinking that this is an opportunity for him to go on there and kind of clear the oh, air yeah. with some people uh you know so maybe that's part of it i, yeah, I don't that know did, that didn't work out too well <laughs> <laughs> so 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 anthony's anthony so guys uh anthony's uh theory i, I haven't been following yasser Kadi very much although i am now since he uh man you get my videos you get you start filing false copyright complaints and stuff like that i start paying a little more <laughs> attention to you uh you get a, you get on my list now the sucky part for yasser Kadi is um my inclination is oh is always to go after their profit, right? Like they do something dirty, right? Like they do something dirty, and I come out with Islamicize me. They do something dirty, I come out with Muhammad's boom boom room. It's just it's it's how I roll. So I haven't decided what to do yet, but uh, yep, there will be some stuff, some videos made in honor of Sheikh Yasser Qadi. But uh, anyway, the the uh, Anthony's theory is that because of some of the things that he's been saying in the past that are viewed upon as uh, compromise. Um, by certain Muslims uh, that maybe by going on with Muhammad Hijab, he's trying to show them, nope, guys, I'm on, I'm on your side here. I'm, a, I'm on your side. And that's what he thought he would do. And then kind of backfired. <laughs> and they view him as a guy who's uh, uh, <laughs> questioning the, the preservation of the Quran. And that kind of makes sense because and, and- af- after he said all that stuff, after he said all that stuff, then he goes on and starts, and I'm going to take down, and I'm going to refute Dan Brubaker and stuff. And it was almost like he's saying, guys, all of you who are attacking me now, keep in mind, I'm, I'm on your side. I'm, a, I'm your champion here. And it's, so it does seem like he has those tendencies. <clears throat> and, and at the same time, I think it goes in both directions. I think Muhammad Hijab, on the one hand, uh, as a Salafi, you know, looked somewhat askant at Whoa. him. But also Whoa, highly- hey, 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 hey. Muhammad Hijab is a Salafi? Yeah, he holds to, well, the way he'll put it is he'll say he's an athari, which is just another way of referring to the Akita of Salafism. Uh, whoa, 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 hey, hang on, hang on. Salafis hang don't like that terminology. Hang on, hang on, hang on, because, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can count on like... I can count on like three or four fingers the number of Muhammad Hijab videos I've ever watched. But uh, when I debated him, I pointed out that Allah has a literal, according to Muslim, I thought, I, I had assumed that he was a Salafi, but by the way, he acts. Um, and so when I debated him, I said in one of my points that, uh, that Muslim scholars say, uh, that Allah has a literal body and he laughed at it and said, which scholars? And so I concluded, oh, he must not be a Salafi and he must be from a sect that doesn't adhere to that. And I couldn't figure out what are you, if he's a Salafi, if he's a Salafi, what the heck, if he's a, did that? He, he he was he was chucking and jiving. He I I think that what he was doing there was trying to play off of the use of the term literally because I, a lot of Muslims will will say uh, Allah has these features uh, eyes ears hands, but you know they're not like our hands. And so I think he was just probably going to play on the ambiguity of the word literally, perhaps yeah, like but it's so, not. But 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 Salafi, Salafis would say they're literal hands. They're just not like ours. Yeah, but so I, I just think that he was playing a game there. I can assure you that wow. he does say that he holds to the fact that Allah has eyes, ears, hands. Uh, I have well, videos that, of well, him. Hold on. Fact, I, have, I, have, I have videos of people going up to Muhammad Hijab, chasing him down in Hyde's Park, 
trying to get him to answer directly questions regarding Allah's hands, his eyes, and that sort of thing. And he's forthright uh, eventually about saying, yeah, he, he holds to the, the Athari creed. Well, that's interesting, because, that's interesting because you, you find out that, that Muslims who don't really study this stuff, they think it's ridiculous, right? They think it's ridiculous to think that Allah has some sort of literal body. Uh, but you start you know, studying this stuff and finding out the arguments from the Muslim sources based on why Allah has a literal body. And, you know, if you want to reject that, you got some you got some splaining to do. Um, so if Muhammad hijab it, it's basically in the debate, he said, what scholars? And then the audience laughs. Oh, that's so stupid. Like they 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 they, they don't realize they're laugh one. They're laughing at Islam. And two, they are definitely laughing at and mocking the Salafi view of Allah. So, gosh, these guys don't man. I mean, he he threw he threw yeah. he threw the Salafi view of God under the bus and mocked it. And you're saying he's a Salafi? That is that is very interesting stuff. All right, all right. Should we jump back? Uh, should we continue here? Yeah. All right. Here we go. And I may ask him questions. I may do that, but I wouldn't backstab them. You know, I wouldn't kind of call them on, press these questions, and then say, "Oh, you know what? Uh, he needs to be refuted." <laughs> <laughs> so this is where you've got this statement by obviously Muhammad Hijab to gain his own popularity. Finished. Wallahi well, you're finished. Wallahi well, you're finished. <laughs> <laughs> happen people this is what <laughs> but I want to say look listen people in many ways Sheikh Yasser Qadi Muhammad Hijab in many ways this is for them just chickens coming home to roost they are part and parcel of this mob culture of creating this we need to refute people this, you know, this refutation culture of like, oh, if you're a And Yasir Qadi is one of the biggest proponents of this. Not so long ago, he, he made a video where he was speaking about me. He doesn't mention my name, but he's saying, yeah, you know, this. And he's speaking about these so-called muftis. And, and he says that the, this, this scholar, uh, we wish he would rather than claiming to be Sunni Maliki, just call, just claim to be of another sect, non-Sunni, Mu'tazili or something, so we don't have to refute you. Acha-cha-cha-cha. Uh, <laughs> uh, did, did you catch that? So um, cha -cha -cha. They're, they're telling him, um, so apparently Yasser Qadi is saying that he should stop referring to himself as a uh, Sunni Maliki and call himself something else so we don't have to refute him, right? But notice, I mean, if that's what they said, then the implication would be, well, if you call yourself some, you know, something other than Sunni, if you put yourself out of the fold, outside of the fold of Sunni Islam, then we could just say, you know, he's he's a he's a, a hypocrite or a heretic or something like that. We don't we don't have to deal with him, and so they view him as a problem because he's he's claiming that he's a Sunni Muslim and so on. And so people are coming saying, hey, are these are there these different views within Sunni Islam that we need to think about? Do we, do we need to take uh, Mufti Abu Layth uh, seriously? And so. Uh, interesting. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, you, we'll watch some more. Well, yeah, you, you know, it's interesting is he he does have according to him in other lectures uh a really good background in terms of hadith studies so his criticisms for example of the hadith which would bring some of their ire right reason that some of these guys would say just don't say you're a maliki say you're something else uh that's where some of that would come from uh but he has a, a, a you know competence or background in, in some of this and what's interesting is he says the the same thing about uh, what's going on in the Islamic world uh, among scholars with respect to Hadith 
that Yasser Qadi is saying is taking place among Muslim scholars with respect to the Quran. Mm. Right. So it's interesting. There's kind of a mirror here uh, and, and completely separate discussions. But Abu Layth in his criticisms of the Hadith, he says that there are there's all these discussions among Muslims taking place, uh, scholars. Uh, and uh, that's basically what Yasser Qadi. And I don't remember if it's in the video with Muhammad Hijab where he mentions that. Uh, uh, but he mentions that he's part of a group of a lot of Muslims who have been talking about this. Was that in the video? Yeah, uh, he, he's saying. Recall? Yeah, he's saying it, and 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 one of them sort of exposed what he had said in order to try and bring him down. Is that is that the part you're talking about? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's in that video. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I see so many things. I'm thinking, where was that at? Because he he mentions that he's part of this dialogue with with uh, you know scores of scholars where they're wrestling with these issues. And and and, and if he's talking about scholars that he's interacting with behind closed doors. You know, you're, you're talking uh, about a significant uh, body of people. Uh, you know, he, in other words, Yasser Qadi is not having this discussion. He already says he doesn't want to have it before the public, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's willing to maybe talk to, about some things in a class that people pay for. Uh -huh. So what must this group of scholars that he's talking about uh, be, right? We're talking here, then, I think, about, uh, you know, people that are really high up the rung, you know, of the scholarly ladder in the Islamic world, mm -hmm. if they're all over there pooling their common uh, knowledge and they're not being, they're not able to come up with a, a narrative that, that fills in the hole, uh, that's huge. Yeah, that is a, that is a problem. So in, in, other, words, in, in other words, it's not just, Yas when Yasser Qadi says there's holes in the narrative, mm -hmm. In a sense, there's there's scores of other scholars that he that are in a sense speaking through his mouth because mm -hmm. he's interacting with them, but hasn't been able to come up with an answer that's adequate to to quell uh, what he considers to be significant problems. Yeah, and then he's saying he he thinks he might have something, and he's running it by scholars to try and come up with it. But but notice, I mean, based on what he's saying, it's people have no idea. And he's working on a solution. But notice, so this is 14 centuries of Islam. And they still can't figure out what the situation is with the, the Ahruf and the Kirat and those relationships to, you know, the Uthmanic recension and things like that. And they don't know. And these are these are fundamental. These are fundamental issues to any sort of and, and anything you want to say about the Quran being perfectly preserved, right? So you have the you have the claim that there's just one Quran and there's no variants anywhere. That's just complete idiotic nonsense, right? Um, the claim that someone like Yasser Qadi is going to make is, no, you have these different kirat and stuff like that, but they're, they're somehow all from God. And that's what he's trying to make sense of. He's trying to figure out how to make sense of that, a, a working theory of how that is possible. But notice what he's saying. We can't figure out how these different Qurans are all somehow revealed by it. We don't know. We can't figure it out. And I've come up with an explanation. I think I might have come up with uh, something I want to roll with, but i got to run it by some some scholars and stuff like that. Uh, but nothing I can say. Um, and I guess if he's, if he's running his theory by various scholars and stuff, he might not even cover that in his class. He might just be, you know, trying to get people to understand the problem and maybe some historical solutions um, but uh, well, notice, notice, this is this is the preservation of the Quran. All these guys are running around saying the Quran's been perfectly preserved. It's perfectly preserved. It's perfectly preserved. And you've got Yasser Qadi, who's on he's on the cutting edge as far as as far as the the, the scholars he's interacting with and stuff. And they have no idea. They have no idea what they're doing. So this is wow, it's amazing stuff. Yeah, and and apparently he, he's not overly comfortable or solid or convinced of his own theory. I wouldn't think because he's a little upset that somebody leaked those interchanges. Right? He, uh, that's that's part of the issue. I think uh, that was behind hijab asking certain questions. Those those interactions were leaked. Where these scholars are talking about the holes, the problems. Right? Uh, and, and so people want some clarity on some of this and. Uh, you know, I mean, I understand, though, in, in, in terms of academia, you, you, you don't want to just throw something out there uh, before everybody, before you, you get other, you know, heads involved and, and ask them to, to point out something maybe you just overlook. But when I think of just how difficult it would be to even try and, uh, I mean, as you know, you can, you know, oftentimes people think too uh, simplistically when it comes to a contradiction. Mm -hmm. You know, you see two things that appear to be problematic, but there, there's often a third thing that can reconcile those, right? 
And, and often what we're doing is we're asking how plausible that third thing is to, mm-hmm. to account for these two things not being in conflict. Uh, but what Yasser Qadi has to do is bring together a whole bunch of things. He has to get the, uh, the, the Hadith narrations regarding how things happened to comport with the textual history, right? He, he, he can't just come up with a theory, in other words, that accounts for these manuscripts. It's got to be a theory that also encompasses or accounts for what we have in the Hadith. Otherwise, he undermines the Hadith. And you, and you can't, you know, initially somebody might undermine a Hadith and think, okay, no big deal, we have to throw out this Hadith. But, but once you do that, you realize that, well, then, whatever criteria led to the establishment of that Hadith is valid, well, then we have to question those other Hadith that are built on the same methodology, right? So you, you unravel a bunch of things. That's why you got to run it past all these other people. What have I not thought about? What, what you know? Uh, but it, it's incredible to me still. You, you, again, think of best case scenario, right? He's got what he thinks is a good answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, how likely is that to work? In other words, you've had 14 centuries of Islam. Mm-hmm. All these scholars prior to Yasser Qadi, whom Yasser Qadi would uh, acknowledge to be his superiors uh, intellectually and in terms of their, uh, their, their competence in these different sciences, uh, Ulum al Quran, all these different sciences, uh, you know, Hadith scholars, uh, uh, jurisprudential scholars, all these different people, none of them have come up with these, uh, any of these solutions. Yasser Qadi's been aware of this problem for decades, going back to his university days. It's continued to plague him all the way down till the present. He's been interacting with uh, scores of scholars in, in private interchanges. And now when he's on a broadcast with uh, Muhammad Hijab, and accidentally says something that's less than uh, what Muhammad Hijab wants to hear, he starts talking about, well, I've got this idea that I'm running mm-hmm. past some people. I mean, that just, yep. it strikes me as uh, just the, you know, he's standing way out on the ledge of a branch, and way out on the ledge of a limb of a branch, ra- you know, really out there on the uh, ledge of a, a twig or a leaf, uh, you mm-hmm. know, hoping desperately that, that it's going to hold him up. Yeah, guys, uh, uh, here's uh... a... <laughs> Here's an important point for you Muslims who are who are watching, right? Yasser Qadi is is acknowledging that 14 centuries of Muslims who've been trying to figure this out because this started during the lifetime of Muhammad. This problem of the Ahruf and uh, supposedly different versions of the same verses somehow both being acceptable and so on. And you have uh, that's just that's where the problem gets started because they run into all kinds of other problems. So many that Uthman has to burn all the manuscripts and then they they end up with massive more problems after that. And you have Muslims try to figure this out and they try to, well, how do we explain this? And Muslims have been working on that for 14 centuries. And according to Yasser Qadi, wow, we have some little cute little answers that we give amongst ourselves. And we say, oh, it's just this. And oh, it's just that. And we say, oh, that's good. And he says, then we run into Western academics and they just they rip it to shreds. They rip it to shreds. And he even sa- he even said, you remember this? He said, and you know they're not lying because they're quoting your own sources. You know they're right, <laughs> right? And he goes so. They, so yes, they're refuting our theories by quoting our sources. But notice, what is the one explanation that Yasser Qadi is not considering? Right? He's saying, hey, 14 centuries. We we still haven't figured this out. And Anthony's pointing out, well, what are the odds that? that Yasser Qadi has stumbled onto the correct one. Pretty slim, right? If everyone else has failed, then probably, you probably got something that you think is going to handle it differently and stuff. But as soon as Western academics get a hold of it, they're going to rip that apart too, right? So yeah. th- th- so th- notice the, the, the explanation that he has not considered is that there is no explanation because it's a bunch of nonsense. That's the explanation, right? In other words, Yasser Qadi, there's a reason you can't make sense of all of this. It doesn't make sense, right? You had, here's here's my theory, Anthony. Here's my theory. You had, so I'm not a, uh, I believe that Muhammad existed. I'm not one of these kinds of skeptics and so on. I believe Muhammad existed. I believe he's receiving revelations, delivering revelations and so on. I don't believe he's really receiving revelations from God, but I believe he's actually getting revelations that he believes are revelations from God and so on. Um, and he delivers these to his followers and it doesn't work very well, right? That this method of we're all going to memorize it. 
I think you do end up with a lot of problems. And that's why you have uh, people dying who had these. That's why you have Aisha saying, you know, hey, this this surah used to have 200 verses and now it only has 73. That's why you end up with all these problems. Uh, then you have people memorizing the Quran, but doing so imperfectly. And that's why you have uh, Uthman needing to burn all these manuscripts. And then you have, you know, the, the letters, but, you know, you haven't included the dots. And so once you start do, you know, including those in different parts of the Muslim world, they're going to get those wrong as well. They're going to make mistakes there. And it's just a big sloppy process. It's a big mess that you end up with. And then later Muslims try to go and write into the history. Oh, that's explained by this. Oh, this came up missing. Well, that's because of abrogation. Oh, this is different. Oh yeah, that's because Allah revealed it in different ways. Oh, there's this and they have an explanation for everything, right? And then you get down to, you know, our time and Muslims are taking these theories and they're trying to, okay, let's come up with the solution to all this problem. And th there is no solution because those were never real solutions to begin with. Those were little patches uh, as those were little band-aids that you know, Islam's just bleeding all over the place, bleeding nonsense all over the place. And they're trying to patch it up and trying to put band-aids on there. And then you've got, you know, 14 centuries later, uh, oh, let's take all these explanations and make the one unifying theory that explains everything. And you can't because it's just, it's, it's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. All right. Should we check out some more Mufti Laith? Abu Laith? Let's do it. Yep. Oh, wait, 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 before we do, check this out. My <laughs> goodness, comment right here. Islam Dugiev says, I have nothing against Christianity, but why mock other religion like David Wood does? <laughs> Anthony, is this coming from the same guy who uh, who's first rightly guided caliph? Guys, close your ears if you're, uh, if you're a child or something like that. Abu Bakr, the first of the rightly guided caliphs, was with Muhammad when... Uh, Abu Bakr w became angry over uh, a pagan saying something. And Abu Bakr, the first of the rightly guided caliphs, Muhammad's father-in-law and the uh, uh, his, his closest companion, said, why don't you go suck a lot's clitoris? This guy believed in a pagan goddess named Allah. He said, go perform oral sex on your god. That's how Muhammad's own companions responded to the religious beliefs of people they disagreed with. Go perform oral sex on your goddess. So, uh, Islam Dugiev, um, you don't see a problem here? Now, why, why, does, uh, why does Allah in the Quran call Jews and Christians the worst of creatures? Surah 98 verse six, the worst of creatures. We're the worst of creatures. What's going on with that? Do you not, do you not understand what a hypocrite and a crybaby and a coward you sound like when you've got your religion that's been slaughtering and raping and pillaging and robbing for 14 centuries. And then we get down to our time and I say, guys, those people who tell you perfect preservation are all liars. And you go, why are you insulting us? You're hurting our feelings. How could you do this to us? Oh my goodness. It's so pathetic. It's the most pathetic thing I could even imagine. For 14 centuries, we go around robbing, enslaving people, taking women as our sex slaves, taking little girls as our sex slaves, slaving populations, slaughtering people, destroying churches, destroying synagogues, destroying it all, leveling it all, lay waste, Allahu Akbar, attacking everyone, attack in all directions. And we say, hey, your guys are saying perfect preservation right down to the letter. That's false. You <laughs> well, you can't say that. Well, why would you do that to us, David? Oh, my goodness. Dude. Go somewhere else with this nonsense. <laughs> it's so pathetic. It's so sad. Uh, do you do this because Muslim do this to you? What about turn to hut e other cheek? Anthony, has it ever occurred to you that Jesus teaching about turn the other cheek has anything to do with allowing people to spread lies and not correcting those lies? Is that what turn the other cheek means in your Bible, Anthony? No, no, no. In fact, uh, e even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says things that, uh, you know, wouldn't be flattering to certain people. Uh, but uh, in, in any case, the, the when Jesus is not even denouncing self-defense in that text, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for a number of reasons. Yeah, that, 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 re that referred to, that referred to more of an insult, right? 
than than to like someone's coming to kill you or something, right? Yeah. Well, well, for one, I mean, yeah, the idea is, uh, you know, not to have a sort of tit for tat attitude, and certainly we don't have that sort of thing where it's, uh, you know, every slight that somebody gives us, we're we're bent on, you know, exacting vengeance on people and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There's a whole thing that we could go into talking about a lot of that sort of thing. But it, it should be obvious from the, the picture that's presented of Jesus throughout the Gospel of Matthew, where that statement occurs, uh, that, I mean, it's the same gospel, right, that we were just talking about a minute ago, where Jesus yeah. was denouncing the Pharisees, right? Clearly, uh, Jesus' understanding of that statement isn't the way that it was being used by John Crypto or the way somebody like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Doug Yev here would, would understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so people need to do their homework a bit better than, you know, yeah. just, to, just to parrot certain things. With uh, little understanding. Rory Husky says, David Wood, don't forget the, uh, that he calls us filthy in Quran 9. Yeah, that's Surah 9, verse 28. Um, well, in fact, yeah, since we're talking about... Yasser uh, Qadi said that, right? With the text, no, we, since we're talking about problems with the text of the Quran, right? Re remember that uh, one of the variants that exists, not just in the, uh, you know, uh, Kira'at, the, the, it's not just a pronunciation difference, Right. But there, there, in Surah 98, 6, one of your favorite passages, you know, where it says that uh, Jews and Christians are the worst oh, yeah. of creatures. Right. There's actually a variant there. One variant says they are the worst of the innocent. So, in other words, among those who are innocent, uh, Jews and Christians are the worst. Uh, and, and it talks about Allah punishing them and so forth. Well, why is Allah punishing innocent Jews and Christians? <laughs> uh, that's a, in fact, this goes against something that Shabir wants to keep saying. Even though Shabir admit, admits that there are these variants, he says that none of them significantly affect meaning. Well, that significantly affects the meaning, doesn't it? Right? If it, mm -hmm. if it says uh, the worst of creatures or the worst of the innocent, well, that's a significant difference. Uh, so uh, the Quran insults people. It insults Jews and Christians. You're the worst of creatures, David. Uh, and so am I. And so are all the Christians that are watching this. So are all the Jews in the world. Uh, the Quran encourages Muslims uh, to consider Jews like apes and pigs because it says Allah, you know, change their faces and, and transform them into, uh, you know, uh, beasts and so forth because they didn't keep the Sabbath day. I mean, all this sort of thing comes from the Quran. It's, it's not like Muhammad, uh, you know. In fact, I, I think uh, Abu Layth is funny here. Uh, in one of his videos, he, he pretends that, uh, you know, certain Muslims uh, want to present Muhammad as though he were uh, like this hippie, right, mm -hmm. in the seventh century. Uh, but, but certainly he wasn't, um, you know, he, he didn't speak favorably about people's gods. Hey, hey check, check this out. Nabil <laughs> LX here it says, glad hijab ended you in a debate. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that yeah. must be something that happened before, <laughs> in which case, if it was the end, I'm kind of having trouble getting that to comport with the fact that we're sitting here right now. Allah praise, Allah yeah. praise for Muhammad, not to Muhammad, Anthony. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, and, we can and, revisit that whole... And I'm a Salafi, but I laugh at the Salafi view of God. Yeah. <laughs> here, here's, 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 what, here's what's hilarious. Hijab has ended precisely one career. Yeah, Yasser Yasser Qadi, <laughs> and it wasn't in a, <laughs> it wasn't in a debate. The, hey, yeah, I, and, I, I, Anthony, that this would notice. So this is a YouTuber. This is a YouTuber, Muhammad Hijab, inviting Sheikh Yasser Qadi, so a Muslim scholar, onto his program to 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 get the scholarly truth to the people on YouTube, and then completely torpedoes Yasser Qadi's entire career so that now he's scrambling in, in full panic mode, deleting stuff, embarrassing himself. This would be like me inviting, hey, William Lane Craig, will you come on my live stream with me so we can talk about some interesting issues? And I get I get, I get William Lane Craig on here and I start saying, now you said this, I really want to know about this. What about this? And he's saying, I don't think I should talk about that in the show. Too bad, you're going to talk about it. And then everyone hates <laughs> and everyone hates William Lane Craig and he loses his job. <laughs> that's that's basically what this would be like. That's what just happened. And so, wow, a job, sinking, sinking careers. Go ahead. Yeah, by the way, it reminds me, uh, Hijab's remark when he says, uh, we will refute you. Uh, 
I, I don't know if you've ever read Joseph Smith, the, uh, the false prophet that founded Mormonism. If, uh, he has this discourse where he says, and I remember this verbatim, I used to live in a context where there were a lot of Mormons, uh, but there's this discourse where he says, you have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and remove the veil, right? So that's an exact quote, that's verbatim. Uh, he says, I will refute that idea and, and remove the veil. What's funny is when you look at the rest of the discourse, he never gets around to refuting it. He never even addresses it, really. So, mm -hmm. uh, But it, uh, I, I bring that up here because when I heard Muhammad Hijab saying, I will refute you, it immediately made me think about that. And now, I don't know how long it's been, but I don't think we've heard a refutation yet from Muhammad Hijab, have we? Mm -mm. Uh, we haven't heard Muhammad Hijab, and, and I'm, I'm not pretending that he was uh, saying he was going to do it the next day or what have you, but still, it's been a bit. Uh, wh when is this refutation coming? When are we going to hear this uh, grand refutation of Yasser Qadi? And, and, and in fact, uh, if he thinks he's going to refute Yasser Qadi, uh, he's, he's miles below Yasser Qadi in, in terms of his sophistication and knowledge yeah. of the Islamic sources. That's part of the issue here. Mm -hmm. That's why it, it created such an, a, a problem. Yasser Qadi is not a slouch. He knows his material. His command of the, uh, in fact, this brings up another thing, by the way, uh, often Muslims want to, uh, you know, dismiss what we say because we don't know Arabic. This is another reason why it's significant that it's Yasser Qadi saying this. Nobody will doubt Yasser Qadi's ability uh, to, you know, uh, to speak Arabic. Uh, most people recognize that Yasser Qadi speaks Arabic exceptionally well, right? That's, that's one thing that a lot of people uh, just really, you know, uh, kind of ooze all over Yasser Qadi for because, they, oh, he's just so eloquent, right? Well, Yasser Qadi uh, obviously knows his Arabic. And so, I mean, I don't know uh, who Muhammad Hijab is to even, you know, pretend that he can go five minutes uh, round and round with Yasser Qadi if they were seriously going at it. Mm -hmm. But in any case. Um, quick comment here, and then we'll uh, check out a little bit more and uh, probably won't go too much longer. But uh, I don't know. We've got around 1,500 people watching. So, uh, But Wolf Puppy says, sorry, I am a young Muslim, 15, year olds, 15 years old, haven't studied Islam like most people in my age, but I think you guys are misleading viewers with fake evidence that the Quran is fake. I'm not sure what you mean by uh, fake, Wolf Puppy. Um, we're, we're not saying it's a fake book. We... we we'd say it's a it's a it's a fake revelation from god right it's it's not a real revelation from god and we offer arguments for that but uh 15 is a good uh, is a good stage in life to start studying these things because um the the real issue that we've been focusing on here uh wolf puppy is that muslim apologists and scholars say things that they know are false to young Muslims like you. And they'll tell you things like, the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. It's a miracle of Islam. And so you, wolf puppy, they'll send you out to go talk to Jews and Christians and things and say, your scriptures have been corrupted, but my scripture has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. It's a miracle. And this shows that my religion is the true religion, the final religion. But what they told you is a total lie. We go to your sources. We can go to we go to your sources, and we show that entire chapters were lost, that large passages were lost, that verses were lost, that were eaten by a sheep. These are your sources, right? Go to Sunan Ibn Majah. You can look it up on the internet. Go to Sunan Ibn Majah, number nineteen forty-four. Talks about Aisha having the only copy of certain verses of the Quran, and her sheep came in and ate them. They're not in your Quran today. You can read your Quran from beginning to end. They're not in there. You go to Sahih Muslim 2286, Abu Musa, one of Muhammad's companions, uh, says that he's, he's talking to the new generation of Quran reciters, and he says, don't harden your hearts the way we hardened our hearts, and we forgot two entire chapters of the Quran. These are the things that we find in your sources. So again, I just gave you references. You can go look those up. You can look them up right online on Muslim websites and read these passages. And what you're going to find is, if, especially if you study it more, but you'll find that the Quran has been changed over and over and over and over and over again, and your leaders lie to you. And the reason I say you're at a good age, because when uh, when people are too young, they just automatically believe whatever their parents, uh, their parents believe, uh, whatever their parents tell them. 
And then if you're too old, if you're in your you know 40s, 50s, you're not at an, you're not at an age when you want to reevaluate all of your life decisions and you know change your entire religion. You're usually stuck into it, right? You're you're married to a person who shares your religion. Your kids share the same religion. It's 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 far more difficult. But the age you're in right now, you know, that age 15 to 25, that's that's when you want to be looking into these things because, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're no longer at the period where you just mindlessly believe what your parents told you, but you're not totally, you're not set in your ways. So check it out. You're saying you think we're wrong, but you're saying you haven't studied this stuff. Go study this stuff and then tell us we're wrong. But if you go and study this stuff, you're going to find out that your scholars and apologists are wrong and that they're lying to you. And the question we want you to ask after you study this stuff is, if my leaders were lying to me about this, what else are they lying to me about? And why are they lying to me? And once you ask that question, you are on your way out of Islam, my friend. All right, Tony, should we look, watch a little more from uh, from our Mufti yeah, friend? Yeah, I think... Uh... I think there's some good stuff coming. All right, let's check it out. Now, <laughs> you know, check this out, people. Check this out. <laughs> Sheikh Yasser Qadi, Qadi Saab. Qadi Saab. When you know, look, this is my nasiha to to Americans. You know, Americans really don't know how to handle this stuff. Two things they can't handle. One seems to be they can't handle women. <laughs> as soon as they get on certain, uh, what, as soon as they get to a certain kind of fame, usually they're a big problem, you know. And two, they can't. H hang on, hang on. What, what, what do you think he means there? Like at first, when he said they can't handle women, like you might think that he means control women or something like that. But then he says, as soon as, uh, as soon as. Uh, as soon as they get to a certain level of prob uh, uh, popularity, there are problems, right? And you think he's talking about like some of the scandals like with Numan Ali Khan and uh, what's his name, Hamza Tsortsis or something like that, where yeah. they, they get into these sort of scandals on how they're interacting with, uh, with ladies behind the scenes. Yeah, and, he, and he's using this to, uh, I'm trying to think of his second point. I know you cut him off, but the... Uh... His, his next, I, I his, his next, his next one is they can't. He says they can't handle two things. Sort of the the west, the western, Mus, the western Muslim uh, yeah. apologists and scholars. They can't handle two things. One, they can't handle women. As soon as they get to a certain level of pro, of popularity, yeah. they got problems. And two, they can't handle controversy. They don't want to deal with controversy. Yeah. Okay. Because because I don't think he's suggesting that Yasser Qadi has any kind of uh, you know disreputable things going on with respect to the first one. Yeah, I've never, uh, so I've, I've, I've never is, heard I've never heard anything like that about him. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I, I I do think that uh, uh, you know, he says that this is my nasiha to uh, Americans, meaning my advice. Uh, but so uh, I I think that's what he's talking about is these people get a platform and then suddenly I mean you see it in in every context really right I mean a person starts getting all sorts of attention and. You know, if if they don't have a lot of integrity, then then you know some people are going to be in some compromised positions and maybe even succumb to to certain things. You know, mm -hmm. in other words, if a person's a dirtbag and they get in a position to be a dirtbag with impunity, yeah. then they will. Yeah, that's that's, and that's that, that, uh, yeah. That. That's not just true of uh, <laughs> that's not just true of uh, of Muslims. There could be Christians. Yeah, everyone, everyone in, in the, it can be in that same position where you can't handle the, you can't yeah you can't handle the fame or you can't handle the power and stuff and stuff that you couldn't do earlier in life. Now all of a sudden you've got the the popularity or the fame it, or the power to do it. In fact, I know a, a person who claimed to be a prophet that had that issue. Yeah, I can think of one. <laughs> Matter of fact, that's a perfect example, right? Muhammad, once he <laughs> once he uh, once he reached a certain level of, of popularity, there were problems. <laughs> yeah, think about it. I mean, the transition from perfect. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, that's an awesome video topic right there. You show a clip of uh, Mufti Abu Layth there and uh, show him saying, you know, people can't handle it, and then showing Muhammad is actually the one that, that couldn't handle it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, seeking the narrow way says this guy is so joyous i'd actually check out his channel <laughs> you should you you should in fact i'll go ahead and include a link to his live stream uh 
I'll add it. To, I'll <laughs> add it to the description box anyway, in case people want to watch it and uh, and check and check out his channel, right? Uh, all right, yeah. we're we ready to go on to his uh, his uh, con the controversy. All right, here we go. Yeah, handle controversy. People, I king of controversy. You know, <laughs> come ask me how, t and I'll I'll help you. Out. I'll give you some tips. Kazi Saab, Yasser Kazi, he, look, when he's being asked, Halloween, no, 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 too controversial, won't say Halloween is permissible. Oh, no, 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 no. Merry Christmas, no, 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 too controversial, too controversial. Music, is it is it can you clearly say music is not haram no, 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 no too controversial to be clear you know too controversial you know this one this one not nice you know <laughs> men's jewelry uh, controversial. Uh, and, and let, let me just pause it right there well, we'll uh we'll continue this but i i just want to point out what what he's referring to here ladies and gentlemen because i did watch one of yasser Kadi's uh videos on this uh which was something i think it was the one where it was uh uh, can Muslims wish people Merry Christmas? What he's talking about is you 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 go to Yasser Khadi's video. It's titled something like "Can is it okay to you know wish people Merry Christmas?" And you watch his video, however long it is, three minutes, and he talks. He keeps talking in the video, but you finish the video and you're like, "What? I don't. What? What's the answer? I don't know." Right? He talks, but he doesn't actually answer the question because he doesn't want to come down on one side or the other because then then people are upset. And you can look at the at the comments section and it's a bunch of Muslims going, can we wish Merry Christmas or not? What, what, what was it? And so uh, Mufti, Mufti Abu Layth here is, is pointing out, he doesn't want to answer all these questions on Christmas and Halloween and music and the hijab and all these things because too controversial, right? I don't want to upset and offend people with this controversy. And then he's going to, uh, he's going to bring it home here in a second. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting. It'd be funny to do a video going around during Christmas time, uh, past mosques or places where Muslims uh, are, are frequenting, and uh, just record different responses from Muslims to "Merry Christmas." Mm -hmm. Just, uh, it'd just be an interesting video to see. You know, certain people scowling at you, frowning; other people being uncomfortable, not knowing exactly what they can say or not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if people understand that that for a lot of Muslims, it is anathema to call, to wish somebody a Merry Christmas. Yeah. Uh, you know, from for somebody like Muhammad Hijab or Abu Musab, some of these guys that uh, have some very well known YouTube channels, uh, they'll come right out and tell you that if you wish somebody a Merry Christmas, you're committing shirk. So mm -hmm. that's why it's it's a big deal. And and Yasser Qadi is trying to to avoid the the you know attack of of, of anybody on any side of this. Mm -hmm. All right, so now he's gonna get <laughs> this part's hilarious. So, so, so he's, oh, he's saying he's avoiding. Yeah, yeah. he's avo he's a, he, he's avoiding all these controversies, and then he's gonna talk about which controversy he decides to start with. <laughs> here, here we go. No, 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 no. A cha cha cha. Uh, hijab, oh, too controversial. Beard, oh, too controversial. Bukhari Gate, can we speak about Bukhari? Gate? No, 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 too controversial. A cha cha cha. The first controversy he wants to begin with is the Quran is preserved. <laughs> oh man, what? is this? <laughs> What is going on here? I mean, is that the controversy you want to begin with? <laughs> that, you know, things like Merry Christmas is too controversial. Halloween is too controversial. So you want to begin with that the Quran is not preserved. <laughs> the, the backbone of Islam. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is the uh, this is the thing. You know, oh well. And people might say that, oh, but Mufti, you know, you're being harsh on him. But am I? <laughs> because in all honesty, did you catch that? He says you might say Mufti, you're being too hard on him. But am I? 
<laughs> this guy's funny. No matter like, how many times, no matter how many times I've heard that, he makes me laugh. Yeah, that is a. Uh, yeah, look, look, every everyone in the comment section. I love this guy. Everyone's laughing. Everyone's, uh, everyone's, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's saying they love this guy. It's, it's funny. Yeah. People, everyone's gonna go to his channel, and there are gonna be people like, I converted to Islam because this guy's laugh is so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh. now, just just so everyone knows, I mean, I I've probably heard this like five times. I I heard it when it when it first came out. I sent it to David. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I kept. I was listening to it earlier on my way to the to get some coffee. I mean, I I've heard it several times, and it still makes me laugh. This is yeah, I know. I mean, yeah, I've watched it. I've watched it a couple times, and I think this is this is uh this is hilarious. Is he always like this in his videos, or is it just like this particular situation is making him crack up? I can't say he's always like this, but he's often like this. So, uh, so he's you know, at first when I saw him, I saw him one time, and I thought. This guy, I think he's just a joker. You know, maybe he's just, you know, because I, I, I don't think I watched a topic that was very interesting. And I just thought he doesn't really know what he's talking about. It was just an a, a initial thing, a, a first impression. Mm -hmm. I have a much greater respect now for how much he does know because I've listened now to a lot of different things from him. And, and he, he has done his homework. Um, you know, he's, he's not at the level of a Yasser Qadi. Uh, but, but he still seems to have a bit more sense, you know, when, especially when you, you know, and, and of course I'm, I'm here making a distinction, right. Between mm -hmm. uh, knowledge and common sense, right. He, he seems to have a good bit of sense about him that mm -hmm. goes beyond Cotty. Yeah. Uh, because uh, he, he recognizes just how absurd it is for Yasser Cotty to avoid controversy when it comes to Halloween, when it comes to the beard, when it comes to wishing somebody a Merry Christmas. But then just stumble right into uh, the biggest of all issues in a discussion with Muhammad Hijab. You know, he should have just put the brakes on immediately mm -hmm. instead of saying something and then putting the brakes on. Yeah, we, yeah we, I mean, which, that was just which he, he he could have right. I mean, he could have just said, "Yeah, uh, yeah, there, there's a there's a thing going on, but you know, I, I am working on on this, and I don't really feel like uh, discussing it in in, in public right now. Uh, you know, but but you know, somewhere down the road, somewhere down the road, once I've I've tested out my views and run them by some scholars, then uh, then we'll discuss it, but." Uh, and he, it was funny because he was clearly trying to do that. We shouldn't be discussing this. And Hijab would push him on it. And then he would blurt something else out and say he doesn't want to talk about it. And, and yeah. Hijab would push him more and he would blurt something else out. <laughs> and so, wow, yeah. the gift that keeps on it, giving there. It, it, it's like having cheeks full of air and somebody's over there poking your cheeks and you're trying to keep your lips closed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, here, here's here's Yasser Qadi sitting on all these problems and he knows it. Yeah. And, and Muhammad Hijab is poking him, thinking he's going to get the answer he wants, but instead ends up getting an answer yeah. that leads him to say, "I will refute you." No, it was it was it was it was very clear the entire time that I mean, when when I had Jay Smith on here a few days back, he he pointed this out um, when Hatun Tash and Jay Smith they showed up with twenty six different Arabic Qurans to Speaker's Corner, and they actually had. Uh, uh, pictures of the Arabic blown up to compare them side by side so that people could not, I, I mean, so that people could, could tell that they're not the same. And they're actually having Muslims in the audience saying, read this and read this, read this and read this. They're different, right? Um, hijab was there and he's going, everyone come, come away, come away, right? He's telling everyone to, to get out of there. So Hijab, he basically understood, hey, they've got something here and I do not know how to answer it. And I, so they, these Muslims here do not need to hear this. They need to be called away from this. They need to get away from this until we have an answer, right? So what happened is Muhammad Hijab, he gets Yasser Qadi on his show. Finally, we can solve all of this. We can solve these problems. We've got a scholar who's been dealing with this stuff for years. He can come on here and explain all of this stuff and I don't have to worry about it anymore. And then, then... When these uh, non-Muslims show us all these different Qurans, we'll have the answer from Yasser Qadi. So he, he really seemed to think that Yasser Qadi is just going to give the answer. And, and all it was is, we should not be talking about this in public. Our answers cannot stand up to scholarly scrutiny. We have nothing. This is no joke. This will shake the foundations of our belief. And so we have to keep quiet, uh, quiet about it. But Muhammad Hijab, 
he still thinks, oh, there, there's a there's a simple, easy, straightforward answer. If I could just squeeze it out of Yasser Khani, I could just keep squeezing him. You will give me the answer. Don't say you're gonna. Don't say take your class. Give me the answer. I'm gonna squish you. I'm gonna squeeze this answer out of you, Yasser Khani. And Yasser Khani, the more he squeezes him, the more he squeezes him, the more uh, the more of his the more of his doubts and admissions come pouring out, like squeezing a toothpaste tube and all this stuff coming all over the place it's just it's a it's it's it's, it's terrible right so now you got now you've yeah. got now you've got this now you've got this uh this toothpaste <clears throat> squeezed all out of yasser Kadi, and yasser Kadi is just this empty tube left over now and he's in panic mode what a what a what a sad sad state so again here's 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 I, i've mentioned this before right if yasser Kadi had not reacted to this situation by attacking all of us and saying we're you know we're Islamophobes and having stuff uh, having stuff you know taken down stuff like that trying to cover it up, these guys uh, you know deleting stuff. If they hadn't done that, we would have been defending Yasser Qadi right now, right? We'd have been saying, guys, these are some difficult issues. As long as he's acknowledged, that, that, as long as he's acknowledging that this perfect preservation nonsense is false. Um, you got to respect his courage for being willing to, to come out with this stuff. Instead, it's attack everyone else. So now it's just funny. Now it's just hilarious that, that this is the situation going on because, uh, because he, you know, he showed his true nature. Go ahead. You, you yeah, want to say something? Yeah. Well, real quick, there was a question a minute ago. Somebody asked about Bukhari Gate, and I actually mentioned this. Yeah, you talked about that now earlier. It came up. Yeah, he, he just used that phrase. He says, uh, in, in the context of saying Halloween, no, we can't talk about that. Uh, you know, the beard, no, we can't talk about that. Bukhari Gate, we can't talk about that. Bukhari Gate is apparently Abu Layth's way of referring to uh, the project that, that uh, he's doing several videos on it. And apparently it's a discussion among uh, other Muslims that uh, regarding the fact that the Sahih narrations in Sahih Bukhari aren't so Sahih after all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, uh, Abu Layth uh, frowns upon certain Hadiths because he rightly recognizes certain Hadiths paint Muhammad in a very poor light. Right. right? He, he quoted one uh, Hadith. Uh, he, he goes through a lot of the same Hadiths that we go through, but he also has some additional ones because he's, he's looking directly at the Arabic, where, for example, uh, in one of them, Muhammad's called a loser because uh, he's he's trying to basically molest this woman who's uh, pushing off his advances. So, uh, you know, he finds a lot of these things embarrassing and he thinks they should be discarded. And Bukhari should not be put on the same level as the Quran, which is true for 99 percent of the uh, Islamic world. Mm. So uh, that's what Bukhari uh, gate refers to. But, uh, yeah, so so we basically just ended here with uh, Abu Layth. Uh, saying, uh, you know, if you if you guys want to learn how to handle controversy, come to me, right? I'll teach you how to yeah. how to handle this stuff. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think of where he's going from here, but uh, I know there are a few good more laughs that are left uh, in uh, Abu Layth here. You could you could just make a super clip of just him laughing, and uh, <laughs> it would be awesome. Uh, Ahmed Hassan here says uh, Yasser Qadi was taught by Orientalists. He doesn't speak for Islam. This guy, uh, this is your work brought back to you. Um, yeah, but obviously, obviously, if he had gone to the Orientalists and found out that they're wrong and they're saying false things, then it wouldn't be much of a problem. And he would say these guys are wrong. But what's the actual situation is he said they don't have this red line that Muslims don't like to cross. And so they will just point out obvious problems. And what did Yasser Qadi said? He said, we know they're right because they're quoting our sources. So he's pointing out that Muslims, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go with the comforting answer, right? So at first, Muslims don't know anything about these, you know, Kirat and Ahruf. They don't know anything about Uthman burning Qurans. They don't know anything about this. Your average Muslim doesn't know anything about any of this. And you hear about it and you think it's a problem. And then the first imam or whoever or apologist who says, no, 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 that, that's just this. You just accept it and you think it's you think you you solve the problem. And so Yasser Qadi is actually breaking down that that goes all the way up to the top of Islam. You go all the way up to the top Muslim scholars and they're just accepting these little answers. And he's saying, if you go outside of our little our little box and you actually go out to some scholars who are going to poke holes in that, he says they poke holes in it. And I and basically Qadi is someone who's realized 
that Muslim scholars do not have the answers to these problems. He hasn't given up on Islam. He's still working on it. He's still working on it. But uh, as me and Anthony have pointed out, does there come a point when you realize there's just no solution because it's not true? That's what I think. All right. Should yeah, we check? Let, let me let me well, let me add something here. It's only a half truth to say that Yasser Qadi was educated by Orientalists. Yasser Qadi was not only educated here in the West, he was educated. Uh, in fact, he went to the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Yasser Qadi isn't, uh, you know, some uh, chump. You know, he, he, he in fact, uh, one of the things he was credited with memorizing the Quran at 15 uh, he went off to university in Medina. He got a doctorate from in Western study. He's he's been educated from both sides of the equation here, and so you'd expect somebody who has that kind of background, especially to be able to tackle this. He's mm -hmm. the perfect sort of person who should yeah. be able to tackle this. He was educated mm -hmm. in Islamic sources by Muslims at prominent Muslim uh, institutions, and he heard the best that Western academia had to to say in response to that. He's the perfect person then to, to adequately address it, if it can mm -hmm. be addressed. The fact that he can't address it, hasn't addressed it at least yet, should be, uh, you know, devastating to Muslims. Yeah, uh, uh, Anthony, I mean, just, you know, because we, uh, we, fo we follow these guys to some extent, but I mean, who, who can you think of who knows, you know, early Islamic history better than, than Yasser Qadi? I can't think of anyone where I would say this guy knows it better. Can yeah, and I, think, I, I, I mean, who's speaking to a Western audience and that sort of thing? Um, no, I mean, I can't think of uh, I can't think of anyone. Yeah. So, guys, um, you might I'll say Muslims, this is no joke. <laughs> this is this is no joke. You've got you've and, got and again. Yeah, see, see, I pointed no, out before Yasser Qadi's in touch with these other scholars that he's interacting with. So he, he's, yeah. he's, again, when he speaks, it's almost as if there are 40 voices coming out of his mouth in the sense that if these other scholars at his level had an answer, then he would know it. Yeah. And, and he hasn't been convinced of anything. They haven't been convinced by him yet. They're working on it. And yeah. have been for 1,400 years. And so Muslims are attacking him, saying, you know, he doesn't represent Islam and stuff like that because, you know, he, you know, he's been in the, basically, he's been, a, he's been among the Westerners too long. Guys. If a Muslim who doesn't interact with the criticisms of Western scholars gives an answer, you should be suspicious of it, right? You should be suspicious. Yeah, that might be convincing if he's in a room full of Muslims who aren't going to challenge him. Um, could his theory actually stand up to the scrutiny of other academics who are going to actually challenge him seriously on this? Um Notice what they want. They want. They want. They want someone who who isn't interacting with Western scholars and stuff like that. But th why would we? Why would we think your theory can stand up to scrutiny if you, if it, if you can't go out and be amongst people who are going to point out what your own sources say that refutes you? So, guys, it's kind of it's almost like it's Yasser Qadi or it's nothing, right? If if Yasser Qadi is if Yasser Qadi and all the research he's done in this area has not allowed him to come up with a solution, you might want to start wondering, maybe there's no solution. All right, let's go. Let's watch a little more. Of oh, what's that? Ready? Here we go. This is the thing. This is what you get. One, this is what you get for, for, for promoting this culture, creating this culture, and for even up until recently being a part of it. This is what, what you are doing. This is what you're doing with people like me. Oh, you're a, this is a deviant sect. These are deviant people. This is wallahi, you know, wallahi, yahi, you know, this is deviant, you know. And then for thinking Muhammad Hijab is a friend, <laughs> he wouldn't give, he wouldn't ever, he would never come on a show with people like me or other people, but he wants to come on a show with Muhammad Hijab. One, putar labbaswad. I just want to point out real quick. He, he's he's actually making an important point, right? You've got Yasser, you've got someone like Yasser Qadi, and he's thinking, no, this guy's from the the wrong the wrong school of Islamic thought. I, I can't interact with this guy. Whereas this guy seems like he could talk to pretty much anyone, and he's going to do so in a in a friendly manner. Um, whereas Yasser Qadi's thinking, oh, uh, let me go with Muhammad Hijab and be interviewed by him, and he's really you know really. 
really you know strict into his Salafi Islam. So th- th- that'll be a that'll be a good showing, and his his whole career gets torpedoed by doing it, which wouldn't have happened if he'd have been having a, a conversation here, right? If if I mean it's, it seems like if he had said I, I don't really want to talk about that. <laughs> It seems like, you know, the Mufti here would have said, okay, well, let's talk about something else. Um, all right. Let's go, ahead. let's go ahead and check it a little more here. <laughs> this is this one not nice, my friend, you know. <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, I, what? Wahdar lisanaka min... Wahdar lisanaka min khillin tunadimu. Allah. Beware of what you say in front of these so-called companion friends. Allah, Allah, Allah. This is it, people. But then it comes back and it bites you. You know, this one, this one bite. <laughs> and so this is, so for being so foolish and stupid, you see, you have to kind of, well, that's his own fault. And look, let me tell you something. He kept saying, oh, we shouldn't discuss this in front of the public. No, no, don't discuss this in front of the public. Don't discuss. Abe o mere chache. Discussing the question was the problem, not discussing the answer. <laughs> when he came to the answer, he, he started saying, oh, come on my course. Everybody join my, uh, enroll on my paid course, and I will then give you the answer. Are, oh, maha, kazi saab. This guy's, uh, this guy's funny. <laughs> um, any thoughts on that? We, uh, it looks like about five minutes left. We definitely don't want to go, uh, we definitely don't want to go into a, uh, uh, we got about, 15 to 20 minutes left when we need to be off. Any comments on this before we uh, continue with the clip? Well, yeah, just just quickly. Uh, <clears throat> Muslims often criticize others for allegedly getting paid, and they're usually trying to insinuate anyone who gets paid for something uh, has ulterior motives or something, as if people aren't performing a service and don't have the right to be remunerated for it or what have you, and, and they can't be uh, anything other than uh, you know lying if they're getting paid. Uh, but but here, notice the one thing you'd expect to be free, I would think, is just being forthright about the Quran being perfectly preserved. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here's Yasser Qadi, and I think this is what uh, Abu Layth is getting at. You know, uh, he's charging you for this, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and that means, I mean, really, when 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 he's saying that, the answer is only available for people who are willing to pay for this. Is he's saying uh, this isn't for everybody, right? This this isn't the sort of thing that uh, I can put out there. To the general public, uh, you know, I, I want to find a way to screen people out, mm-hmm. and I, I suspect that you go into that course, and really, what you're going to get is a lot of obfuscation, just like you were talking yeah. about <clears throat> when it came to the the holiday things. You know, can you wish somebody a merry Christmas? Mm-hmm. You'll listen to the whole lecture and not, you know, get out get out and think, wait a minute, I didn't get an answer to that. Yeah. That's probably what he's going to do in this. You know, well, some scholars say this, some scholars say that, but yeah, you know, uh, we don't know yet. Yeah, because notice anyone. Anyone who's taken his course, if they actually had the solution, anyone who's taken his course can yeah. come out on YouTube, do a two hour interview. And I'm sure you, you know, I understand if he wants to say, hey, you can't really get through this in 15 or 20 minutes, but you should be able to give the the gist in an hour or two hours or three hours or four hours. And if Yasser Qadi doesn't want to do it, then obviously one of his students who's taken his course and gotten the answers should be able to do it. Instead, I, I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm guessing that you go in there and he's probably going to, you know, break down 40 different theories of Ahruf and Kira and all this stuff and explain which one of them, uh, you know, can account for things and which one of them can't, which one of them can't. And that there are problems with all of them and say, but this is what, you know, we have to figure out in the future. And this is why you need me, Yasser Qadi, because I'm going to solve this somehow, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And it's suspicious that, uh, you know, he's been at this for decades. He said this issue plagued him from an early time. So and and he mentioned specifically, he says, I never talk about this in public. Yeah. Right. He, he's done a hundred hours of lectures on the Sira. If he thought he had the answer to this very nagging, terrible problem, 
uh, then it wouldn't be tucked away in this paid course that only you know a select handful of people have access to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that to me is entirely suspicious. But mm-hmm. in any case, yep. Um, <laughs> stuff. Some some people are commenting on his eyebrows. Stuff and things says David Wood. I think his eyebrows are challenging yours to a duel. <laughs> uh, he has some cool eyebrows. His are darker, so he has an advantage. But uh, we'll have to see. All right. I was thinking with with the the beard motif that he has and the yep. laugh, he almost reminds me of uh, the Count on uh, Sesame Street. Ha 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 ha! <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, the question was the problem, not the answer. Give them the answer, or give them some answer. <laughs> Intent. And then he's like, "Oh my God, I've got so much hate now. I've got so much hate." And because now the public are either going to force him to pretend he doesn't believe in what he do, in his problems and pretend that there's no problems that he sees or he's going to have to own his truth and become further disowned <clears throat> and it's chickens coming home to roost because it- uh, th- that was actually an, an important point there. Uh, what yeah. what he brought out, right? So Yasser Qadi s- says what he thinks, and then it's uh, you know it's World War Three on Yasser Qadi from from Muslims, and so w- you know what's he going to do? Is he going to stand his ground and say no, this is my position? In which case he's ostracized by the Muslim community, or does he have to basically lie about his position? Say no, 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 no. What I really meant is this, and you know, of course we can solve that. It sounds. Based on the follow-up, it sounds like he's going in that latter direction, right? Sounds like he's really thumping his chest and saying that there's no problem and he's going to go out and refute all these people. And anyone who says that he was pointing out a serious problem is just an an Islamophobe who's um, an Islamophobe who's, you know, just completely misrepresenting him or something like that. And so it's actually, uh, you know, it would be sad if he hadn't been such a jerk to everyone afterwards, which is what he was. Yeah, yeah, and, and here's here again. I mean, it's the same uh, methodology of Muslims when it when it comes to criticism. Earlier in the broadcast, we were talking about Muhammad. Somebody immediately started attacking you, mm-hmm. right? Uh, well, uh, when we talk about the Quran, Muslims will often bring up side issues. They'll bring up red herrings and try and distract everyone. Uh, they'll talk about how somebody pronounced an Arabic word, anything but the real issue, right? Well, mm-hmm. uh, here in this case, here's Yasser Qadi. Uh, on the one hand, he, he when he brings up this issue, he says, hey, look, they know it's true because they can point to it in our books, right? Yeah. Uh, so so uh, now it's funny, though, because notice what he's doing. In the aftermath, you're referring to his comments after that uh, interview aired. He started attacking people and talking about Islamophobes. What does mm-hmm. that have to do with anything? Yeah. Abu Layth, he's talking about people like Jay Smith, right? He's focusing attention on people like Jay Smith or yourself or whoever else he saw in the aftermath, making reference to his comment. And he's he's now bringing up the issue of Islamophobia. But remember, he's the one who said, they can point to it in our own books. So are the Islamic sources uh, the products of Islamophobes? Right? And, mm-hmm. and what we're looking at are commentaries by other Muslims like Abu Layth. Is Abu Layth an Islamophobe? Uh, is is Muhammad Hijab uh, an Islamophobe? Uh, Muhammad Hijab's the one who's saying he's going to refute him. Mm-hmm. Right? So... Uh, to me, that's just ridiculous for him to start doing that. Uh, all we're doing is saying, uh, "Hey, look, look what uh, Yasser Qadi said." Um, you know, and, and how you know, I, I don't understand how how everybody else is an Islamophobe when you know the the the, the, the protagonist or antagonist, whatever you want to call hijab, uh, he's the one that uh, you know brought this all about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and in any uh, case, uh, yeah. Uh, so notice, uh, so he posted. Two weeks ago or whatever, he posted uh, the video on his channel, Yasser Qadi, as in the hot seat. In the hot seat, Muhammad Hijab interviews Dr. Yasser Qadi and caused a big ruckus. He ended up uh, deleting, I mean, he ended up turning off comments. Muhammad Hijab on his channel ended up taking that part of the interview out. But notice, everyone had questions. Everyone had questions after that. I'm just looking at the videos he's posted since then. He's posted steadily pretty much every day. And the, the, the topics, the Day of Judgment, episode 15, um, the impermissibility of recreational marijuana, 
regarding Hajj cancellation and usage of Hajj funds. The Book of Dua from Sahih al-Bukhari, Part 6. The Day of Judgment, Episode 14. Uh, Q&A session, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Keynote address, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Why is Islam so restrictive? Sheikh Yasser Qadi. The Day of Judgment, Episode 13. Can laws of inheritance be mutually renegotiated? He doesn't want to talk about the issue. He doesn't want to, he won't, he won't, he won't come anywhere near the issue. And guys, for, for the Muslims who are thinking, but, nope, there's, there's some simple answer. It's just pronunciations or something like that. You should be realizing this dude is the reason he's in panic mode is because he doesn't have an answer to problems that he knows exists. And he does not want to talk about it because the more he talks about it, the more you guys will find out about it. And he doesn't want that to happen. And so he's just he's stuck in a position where we're going to keep attacking and he can't even he can't even defend Islam because he knows there are no answers there. But since since you went to his YouTube page, let me point out something that's interesting to me. I, I'm not going to pretend I know for sure the explanation for this, but it is suspicious in, in, in light of everything else. You mentioned that he put the uh, interview up. But then he disabled the comment, so mm -hmm. nobody can leave a comment. But he's been posting steadily since then. Well, it looks to me like he's trying to pad uh, the things that he's posting here yep. because some of those lectures are actually older lectures. He dipped back into his mm -hmm. earlier uh, things that are on YouTube. That the, the keynote address thing there and the Q&A session that he posted a week ago, those, for example, are old lectures. Those are from years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that to me is suspicious. Why did he suddenly put those up there? It's almost as if he wants to push the the, the interview down the page yeah. so that people won't notice it. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't I, want. I, he he doesn't want to remove it. He doesn't want to remove it because it's pointless to remove it, right? We people downloaded it. People downloaded it, so people have it. Other people have posted it, so he doesn't want to do that. Plus, it it would you'd have even more of the Streisand effect. It'd be even more embarrassing. So he wants to leave it, but it looks like he's trying to bury it under other under other content. So he's trying to bury it there. All right, let's watch, uh, let's watch a little more here and uh, see what happens. Oh, this... <laughs> Let me tell you something. He's you know what? Around. My uncle, a legend, yeah. May Allah bless his soul and have mercy on his soul and grant him an elevated maqam in Jannatul Firdaus. You know, once we were in Karachi, yeah, when we were chatting and we were talking about someone, my uncle was telling me about this person and he was kind of criticizing him. And I said to my uncle, I said, I said, Mamu, I said to him that because the person that we were speaking about was poor, poverty stricken. And I said, look, gharib hona, koi galti thori na hoti hai. And my uncle said to me, he said, Hi, yaar. he said, Ye to hai. He said, Gharib hona, galti nahi hai. You know, you, I said, look, the person being poor isn't a, you know, you can't fault him for that. And he said, he said, Hi, yaar. he said, that's true. You know, galti hona, gharib hona, galti nahi hai. He goes, magar puddu hona. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the this is the problem, you see. Like you you see, being an idiot, this is your fault. <laughs> you know, so when you decide to come on when you decide to come on come on live and make these kind of dumb statements and then not even qualify them not even you know when the person's asking just to kind of dramatize the whole thing would you be able to write some a quran that looks like the quran today oof that's a very complex question oof oof yeah but a, but a complicated yeah this one had a so alone oof oof <laughs> <laughs> why would when he act when he acts like Gotti, when he acts like Gotti. Uh, he comes up with like an accent that doesn't, <laughs> he sounds like he's doing like a heavy, uh, like a Indian accent that, but Gotti doesn't, Gotti doesn't have that accent, but, uh, notice what he said there. It's, uh, uh, and then, and then yeah, then we, uh, we should, uh, go ahead and, and, and finish up the clip here in a second. But, um, he's making an important point. He says, you know, someone's poor and he can't help being poor. You know, you don't, you don't blame him for that, but he's comparing that with Yasser Khan. He's saying, what are you talking about? That's your fault. It's, it's your fault for everything you did. If you say a bunch of stupid things and handle the situation really stupidly, I can fault you for that. And so, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, let's check this out. I, I think there's some, I think there's something else cool, uh, coming up here. 
<laughs> what is it? <laughs> you know, so far nulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. Yeah, what on earth is this guy on about? Just look, say what you have to say and then just give some clarity. You know, say that, look, of course, the Quran is going to be the same Quran here. Yeah? What other Quran am I going to write? Oh, this is complicated. You know, this one. <laughs> <laughs> and then people are obviously having a field day. Ex-Muslims are having a field day. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yep. Jay Smith is going on about it. He's made a whole video. That's true. Uh, all these Islamophobes are loving it. Yeah, we are. So, yeah. So, this was the story so, of our beloved <laughs> Qazi Sa, <laughs> who is right now heartbroken. And <laughs> <laughs> this is how Qazi Saab right now is living without a heart. But yeah, so that's that's what happens, people. That's what happens. That's what happens. So yeah, so I had to cover that part and I hope the and but before I went into it, I wanted to cover the topic beforehand of the dynamic nature of the Quran, so people already know. All right, I think he, he he's just wrapping up here um, at this point, and so uh, <laughs> yeah, I have to. Uh, this this dude's uh, this dude's uh, pretty funny. Um, all right, so we gotta we gotta wrap up here in the next couple of minutes. Ah, gosh, I never got to the uh, super chats and super stickers. I'll try and read a couple of these real quick. See what happens. So Ryan Bark uh, with a super sticker. Uh, Isa Kabir said, it's duplicitous to say you must study Lug Arabia. Um, King Buddy says, this guy's saying he'd bury his head in this. This guy's saying he'd bury his head in the sand willingly too. Uh, I don't know. It depends on what his position is. I'm not sure on his position. So, I mean, I mean, notice on, on, on this issue, on this issue, if a Muslim, if Muslims had been coming out for years, saying basically what Shabir Ali says, right? That, you know, yeah, there were Muslims who just kind of remember, memorized the gist. And there are some who tried to be more careful and memorize the exact wording. And we ended up with different kinds of Qurans. And then there was a problem with inserting the dots and you had different dialects. And so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's not a perfect process. It's not a perfect process. But what we have, you know, it's basically what goes back to the time of Muhammad. I would have a problem with it. I would criticize Islam on other grounds, but I would say, oh, okay, if, if, that, if, that, if that's your if that's your your view on how uh, your book came about, that, that that's okay. Then, then yeah, there, there's you can't just do five minutes of research and destroy that view, right? But the claim that they came with perfect preservation right down to the letter that's just delusional and deceptive, right? So the, and and you need all of five minutes of research to completely destroy and falsify that claim. And so what you have is 99 point something percent of Muslims believing this silly, ridiculous claim that is completely false and can can be refuted within five minutes of research. And that's that's kind of what we're going after. So I don't I don't know what his position is. If his position is, yeah, you do have differences and yeah, we're not sure about these things, then then that's, that's far more reasonable than what what most Muslims uh, believe. Um, Rob Applegoo and Sarah Rainey with super stickers. Uh, Zuk Midich in the super chat. Applegoo uh, saying uh, he agreed earlier when I was saying it's pathetic. Yeah, that was. Uh, Johnny Corey in the super chat. Uh, no message hashtag says Abbas from Speaker's Corner says Hafs is preserved Quran, but Bukhari can't trust Hafs. Choose wisely. Yeah, there's a. I mean, it's just funny that. Muslims basically picked one, and now Muslims say that's the preserved Quran. Uh, Sophia, and there were, there were, of course, doubts about Haas. Sophia Film says, as Sam would say, look, an evangelifish. So I think this is back when we were talking about our <laughs> our uh, friend who said we we're doing it all wrong. Max McCormick in the Super Chat. Sophia Film said, how much is the course? Uh, don't know. You'd have to check that out. Chris K says, spent the last five days conversing with a man from Palestine on the Bible versus the Quran. I showed him that Allah committed shirk by making Jesus a partner in creation when Jesus created a living bird from mud. Yep, that is a good uh, good passage to go to. Jazz Beasley said, David, tell me how you find your scholarly works. Uh, I don't mean what you, what do you mean by scholarly works? You're talking about in philosophy or in uh, 
like in philosophy or in Islam or what? I don't know what you, and I, I don't know if you're talking about books or journal articles or, or what, but uh, yeah, no, normally if you're looking for a scholarly work on something, you'd, you'd find it referenced somewhere. So you'd be reading a book on a topic and then you'd see a footnote saying, you know, that th this research came out in such and such journal article. And then you, you go ahead and look that up. Uh, Animal says you can see the holes in Islam when you see the Islamic symbol of the crescent moon. Atul Amato said, uh, uh, Muhammad Nasser, when you have anything smart to say, they start attacking your opponent personally. Oh, yeah. When, when you don't have anything smart to say, uh, start attacking your opponent personally. Yeah, that's a, that is a pattern there. Uh, Anthony with uh, the heart emoji AS says, David, where can I find the goat who ate the Holy Quran? It must be alive somewhere. Uh, it, it might have if it's uh, if it's actually uh, if it's actually miraculous. All right, we got to wrap up. Still some super super stickers and super chats to get to, but we'll have to uh, we'll have to cover these things next time. But uh, all right, any, Anthony, any final thoughts here? Yeah, I got some moth that's attacking me. <laughs> um, no, I just uh, I would encourage people to go. Uh, check out Abu Lais because he's got a lot of other good stuff that uh, actually undermines uh, what a lot of Muslims believe to be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, although he doesn't really have a good alternative. It'd be interesting to hear what Abu Lais thinks he's got mm -hmm. going uh, in, in light of some of the things that he proposes. But, uh, of course, the main issue is that the, the narrative that Muslims have been uh, giving us for, for a long time just isn't true. And we knew that, but, you know, it's amazing how much, you know, can be accomplished by the people on the other side just constantly being in denial. Mm -hmm. Because even though we've seen all this in the Islamic sources, it's still kind of a, a, a rush in the sense to hear people like Shabir Ali and Yasser Qadi admitting that the Islamic sources have all these problems. Right. It, it, it's almost like, you know, if every if you're if you're in a room and you see the clock and it says 530 and you're saying it says 530, but everybody else is over there, you know, not telling the truth. And they all keep saying it's four o'clock. You know, it says 530, but everybody else saying it's four o'clock has you sort of like, you know, what am I crazy or something? Mm -hmm. You know, isn't it isn't this obvious? But everybody mm -hmm. else is. You know, so, so there is something about the fact that, uh, you know, Muslims now admitting this is a significant thing because. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that any of us were over here thinking, what, are we crazy? Because we can all see it in the Islamic sources. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't. But, but uh, you know, it did lead us to at least think what's wrong with the uh, intelligence of Muslims or at least the integrity of Muslims, because yep. it's right there. You know, so why why won't they just own up to it? Uh, and, and in the case of a lot of Muslims, it's just because they didn't know about it. Yeah. Right. In the case of certain <laughs> scholars, we still have to wonder, mm -hmm. gosh, what's going on here? Uh, so, so anyways, the, the Muslims are admitting things now, and in addition, the reason they're admitting it is because the, the evidence was not only there, but now it's piling up. It, it's mm -hmm. becoming even greater, mm -hmm. right? We're getting more manuscripts, and, and people are getting access to the manuscripts, and people are pour, pouring themselves into the study of those manuscripts. So, mm -hmm. so the, the problem is huge, and it's mm -hmm. become too huge for, for Muslims to maintain a poker face mm -hmm. and pretend like there's no problem. <laughs> And it is, a, it is a good time to be dealing with this stuff. So, yeah, as, as Anthony was pointing out, ladies and gentlemen, um, the solution to this, Muslims, the solution, if you're wondering what the solution is, the solution is not to keep denying that there are any differences in the Quran manuscripts and that sort of thing. It's not, it's not to keep saying perfect preservation right down to the letter. It's not the solution. You just end up embarrassing yourself even more as time goes on. The solution is to say, yep. Yeah, there are all kinds of issues with the preservation of the Quran. Yep, chapters came up missing. Yep, large passages came up missing. Yep, verses were eaten by a sheep. Yep, we have all kinds of different Qurans. Yep, the manuscript tradition is, is messy. It's all true. And what we have is still basically the word of God that goes back to Muhammad. That's got to be your position. It's the only thing you could possibly reconcile with reality. But when you finally do that, when you, when you finally acknowledge that that is the, the history of your Quran. Then you've got what we were just talking about. Then, you, then you're going to have to explain why your leaders spent all this time lying to you and to us 
and why you accepted everything they said, even when we were coming to you, showing you from your own sources that what they're telling you is a lie. And so one, why is it so common among your leaders to spread lies? And two, why is it so common for you to deny reality and believe the lies, even when the truth is right in front of your face? Th those, are, those are kind of bigger issues that are going to be uh, part of what comes out in all this. And I'll just close out with this comment here. Uh, Mohammed Fraid says, uh, thank you, David, for helping me leave Islam. Agnostic now. I want to change my name to a non-rapist name. I don't think it's the Frage part. <laughs> All right. Uh, happy to help, uh, Mohammed. And uh, do stay tuned to future videos, future broadcasts. Um, all right. We're closing out now. I'm trying to think when I'm going to be on next. I might be going on with the apostate prophet here in the next couple of days. Uh, we'll have to see what, what, we, uh, what we came up with. Other than that, um, I did say at the beginning that I was going to post a video tonight, but I wasn't planning on going till... Uh, till this late so i might wait till tomorrow for that video but you can check it out then all right thanks for everyone for watching and tuning in uh special thanks to uh mufti abu Layth for giving us a couple hours of <laughs> of fun here all right david wood anthony rogers bidding you adieu